Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February 9th, 2022 Community Formation Meeting. Uh, we'll call this meeting to order at 5.38. Sam, if we could get a roll call, please. Sure. Give me one second. Uh, Commissioner Adam Leakum. Present. Commissioner Alonzo. Here. Commissioner Chavez. Present. Chair Escobedo. Here. Commissioner Kim Johnson. Present. Commissioner Rachel Johnson. Here. Commissioner Killebrew. I'm here. Commissioner Rodriguez. Present. Commissioner Sander. Here. Commissioner Wood. Here. Vice Chair Zapeta. Here. And Commissioner Reno. He is here. That right. completes roll. Thank you, Sam. And now we will go to public comment for items that are not on today's agenda. Sam, do we have anyone from the public that would like to give public comment on items that are not on today's agenda? Give me one second. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on an item not on the agenda, please raise your hand. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on an item not on the agenda, please click on the raise hand feature. There are no hands raised, Chair. Thank you. So we will close public comment and we will move on to our administrative agenda, which we will kick off with an acknowledgement of Black History Month. And uh, we've had already, we're nine days into Black History Month and have had so many amazing um, uh, programming opportunities for Black History Month. And I know that we have the Melanin Gallery on State Street, which I encourage everyone to to go to. Um, Anna and Jordan, I know that you've worked uh, one with a lot of these organizations to um, at least send out the press release. Is there a place where folks can check out what's going on for this month? Absolutely. So thank you so much, um, Gabe. Uh, for everybody that knows, I'm founder, uh, along with other folks, of uh, Juneteenth Santa Barbara. And as the collective of Juneteenth, we try our best to work with all Black-led um, organizations to help plan out events, not only for Black History Month, but all year round, because uh, Black history is very much American history. Um, and so with that being said, JuneteenthSB.org is where you can find a list of all the events, all of the participating um organizations that are, are putting on events this month and throughout the year um and yeah if you have any questions please don't hesitate to reach out to me um but yeah we we've uh gotten pretty much every almost every city and um county to recognize black history month um and we're just really grateful for the opportunity and uh these are opportunities to engage most of the events are virtual um, like Gabe said, Melanin Gallery does have a, a Black History of Santa Barbara. I believe it's uh, called Santa Barbara Black History uh, for the Love of Our People. Um, and it's an amazing exhibition that gives you a timeline of um, accolades of Black individuals, um, identifying individuals in our county. Um, so I really highly um, recommend you go see it. And there's all types of events from TVSB um, to story time, talk of baby story time with um, the For the Little Ones, that's every Saturday. Um, that can be found on various websites. Um, and, and yeah, just go to uh, JuneteenthSB.org and you'll find all that information there. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan. And with that, we'll close out um, item A and we'll move to item B with announcements. And the only announcement that I have is that our city council presentation got moved from what would have been yesterday to next Tuesday on, I believe, the 15th. So we're going to present and update the city council and also ask for a one month um, extension. Uh, we'll close out announcements now and we'll go to considerate. Oh, Dama. I just have a quick announcement. Um, so I've, I've been in contact with the dean at my school at the Santa Barbara College of Law. And uh, they're excited to have um, a presentation from us. Uh, we haven't figured out a date yet because we're we're starting back on campus on the 14th. And so I'll have an update for you guys as soon as possible on when um, we'll be scheduling that. And um, 
if anyone else, I know Liz, Lizzie hopefully was going to be able to join, but if anyone else wants to join and meet um, some of uh, my law classmates, they're very interested in meeting you guys. So you're more than welcome to. Thanks, Daniel. Jordan? Um, yeah, I'm happy to help out with that as well. Um, I was going to say Santa Barbara Young Black Professionals also reached out and they were interested in having um, us come and speak to them as well. So if anybody's available, um, please let me know. They're thinking the 24th, which is a Thursday. Fantastic. And Rich? I'm just volunteering, uh, Jordan. Perfect. All right. Thanks, y'all. So we'll close out announcements and we'll move on to item C of the administrative agenda, which is consideration and action on the draft community formation commission meeting minutes from our last meeting, which was on January 26, 2022. Does anyone have any edits that they'd like to see on the minutes? And if not, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. A motion from Christian. Do we have a second? Second. They're all second. So uh, motion. This tie. So I'll go motion to Christian, um, second to Kim Johnson. And is there any discussion on the item? And Sam, can we do a roll call vote, please? Yeah, let me just ask if there's anyone in the public that would like to speak um, on item 4C, consideration and action of the draft community formation meeting minutes of January 26, 2022. Please raise your hand. If there's anyone that would like to speak on Item 4C, the approval of the minutes for January 26th. Please raise your hand. Seeing none, I will take roll. Commissioner Adam Lincoln? Yes. Commissioner Alonzo? Aye. Commissioner Chavez? Yes. Commissioner Chair Escobedo? Yes. Commissioner Kim Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Rachel Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Killebrew? Yes. Commissioner Rodriguez? Yes. Commissioner Sander? Yes. Commissioner Wood? Yes. Vice Chair Zapeta? Yes. And Commissioner Reno? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Sam. So we'll close out the administrative agenda and move on to our first item tonight, which is item five, and it's review of the outreach materials. So the CFC will review this, what was going to be the survey and the focus group materials, but we're going to hold off on the survey tonight. Um, and these are materials that we developed with the help of NACOL and CCI, Center for Court Innovation. I will turn it over to Cami, and we are going to review the facilitator guide that we'll be um, using in our training for uh, with the facilitators. Cami, over to you. Thank you. Let me just pull it up here. Okay, thanks everyone. So as um, Gabe mentioned, we have been working on um, the facilitator um, or facilitated focus groups um, that will happen the week of, actually they'll be happening on February 23rd, 24th and 25th. Um, there will be nine focus groups based on the, the groups, uh, stakeholder groups that you all have seen in the past, I think maybe not last meeting, but the meeting before um, you all provided input into those lists. And so we're in the process of um, getting the invites out to all of them to bring those groups of people in for those nine facilitated discussions. So we have three people coming in to be faith facilitators. They are all people who work in the field of oversight who also have facilitation experience. Um, one is coming from LA County, one is coming from Oakland, and one is coming from technically Oakland, but he actually um, works with the um, BART Office of the Independent Police Auditor. Um, so we also have note takers for all of the sessions um, from uh, UCSB, who Elise, who is our contact with CCI, and I interviewed and we're, they're very excited about being part of the process as are the, the facilitators. Um, they're very excited about being part of um, what's happening in Santa Barbara. 
as far as oversight is concerned. So a um, couple things that I wanted to go over with you before we talk about the questions that we'll be posing to the focus groups is that the um, focus group working group um, has been working on putting together um, the materials that will be used for each of these sessions, um, including overview of recommendations, slides for each main part of the presentation and set of questions, um, flow charts to help them better understand, because although we will provide the draft recommendations to everybody who's participating, we all know that Maybe not everyone will have a chance to read them. Maybe not everybody will want to read them all the way through, but we want to have them have access to as much information as possible going into the discussion. Each of these focus groups will last about an hour and a half. We anticipate that some may go over that. We'll have two in person and one uh, virtual each day so that we can accommodate um, different comfort levels. Um, and also some of the groups may be better suited to meet in person versus virtual and vice versa. So any questions on kind of the setup and the group of, uh, of the focus groups before we move into the questions? Okay, so bear with me here for a moment while I get us to, okay. So first we're gonna, we're gonna separate it into the review board um, and then also into the Office of Police Oversight. So we're gonna really kind of divide this into two separate pieces. So we're gonna start by giving them a brief overview of what the board does um, as far as recommendations are concerned. Then the first question that, uh, set of questions that will um, be asked center around the membership of the board. Asking them what they think about the current recommendations for the membership, what they would edit or adapt. Is there anything that jumps out that's missing? Key components you suggest the Community Formation Commission consider. Um, also asking them their thoughts on um, the recommendations regarding people with prior law enforcement experience and how they feel about that. The proposed um, recommendations also are also about how they feel about family members of former law enforcement being included on the board. We'll also talk about training. We'll let them know the list that is included in the recommendations, um, ask them their opinions on what they feel is most important or valuable in making sure the board can fulfill its mandate. Um, also, um, how the process by which the trainings are being recommended. Um, right now, as you all know, they are something that is done um, by the Office of Police Oversight in collaboration with the COB, um, as well as the city attorney and the um, police department. So all of, they'll be asked about how they feel about all of that process as well. Um, and then the last part under the review board section is how they feel about the duties, the authorities and duties that you have recommended. Um, Asking them based on their life experience, anything that's missing, um, anything they think needs to be added, as well as um, how they feel about existing complaint process, um, how they feel about how this uh, or challenges might be with in implementing a new oversight process or a way to, or a new complaint process. Um, and then a little bit more about um, what types of things would make them feel more comfortable about filing misconduct complaints. So does anybody have any questions about that first section as far as the community oversight board or civilian oversight board? Okay. The next section is the Office of Police Oversight. Um, again, there'll be some slides and explanation, kind of an overview of what those recommendations entail. Um, talk about their primary responsibilities. And then talk about one of the first things that we're asking them to talk about are um, 
What do you think the roles, of, what are the most important or critical roles of the oversight of police office, sorry, office of police oversight? Um, what, what authorities and duties could be added, taken away um, to make it a stronger process? Also, there'll be some additional questions about the complaint review process. Um, and Lizzie has uh, developed an amazing flowchart of, of this process so that um, it can be, um, people can have a visual of what this would actually look like and then ask their, their questions on it. Um, getting information from them about, you know, developing a collaborative and independent relationship and what, what that means in, in, uh, in their minds. Um, the authority and responsibility of the oversight board as it relates to the Office of Police Oversight. Um, and then again, people with law, prior law enforcement, should they be able to um, serve on the board, serve on staff, and what would help them have more confidence in the pro process? And th any, before I move on, any questions on that section? Okay. And then at the end, there will be some time for them to just share additional thoughts. Um, if they have any, um, provide some extra time for to continue some of the conversations because I, we're on a very, we are trying to pack in a whole lot into an hour and a half. So I'm assuming that there may be some additional need to circle back and, and maybe cover a few things again to make sure everybody feels heard in the process. The um, note takers will be taking as, as close to word for word notes as they can. Um, nothing will be recorded so that we can promote open dialogue as much as possible. And um, we, they will be having the notes back to Elise for, to start analyzing within 24 hours of each facilitated group. Lizzie, Louisa, Rachel, Gabe, did I leave anything out? Um, I don't know if you explain who the note takers are. They are grad students from um, UCSB. Um, and I just wanna, I wanna thank the folks who were on this commit, this work group. I mean, we, we worked hard um, and I'm not just saying it because I was on it, but you know, everybody on that work group, um, Rachel, Gabe, Louisa, myself, Cami, and our CCI um, person met several times a week and did homework in between. And, uh, and I feel like we, we really thoughtfully put this together. So I, I hope that you, that you feel comfortable and have, um, you know, trust in this. I'm curious, um, we have, I haven't heard anything from SVPD or city attorney. And, and if, if you all see any flags in this or, or any feedback. Uh, Commissioner uh, Rodriguez, no, 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 no concerns. That's great. Christian, I see your hand up. Um, yeah, I just wanna echo like, this is so much work. Um, and so thank you for uh, uh, producing. I think it looks great. Um, I guess in terms of, we, we got the list of stakeholders as well, like potential stakeholders. So I'm wondering, are we gonna report out like demographic data on the focus groups uh, in an effort to demonstrate that efforts were made to make it reflective of the, the community? <clears throat> That's a good question. Rachel, is your hand up to answer that? Um, yeah, if you would like me to. I would love it. Um, yeah, so the, the specific demographic capture that we wanna do is gonna be primarily done on the, the paper survey. Um, Cause the idea with the focus groups is that um, folks can maintain some kind of anonymity to their comments as well. Um, so at some point, uh, prior to or after the focus group, 
every, all those participants will be invited to also do the paper digital survey, which has the demographic capture on it. Um, but I think, I mean, Cami, I'm not sure if there's anything else for you to add from you or Elise about kind of the, 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 the style of getting qualitative information from the focus groups is gonna be different than really focusing on the demographics. Our recruitment is hopefully broad enough, um, and that's why those lists and all the nonprofit partners were so mm -hmm. intentionally broad, um, but we're not gonna take demographics the same way as the paper survey. Thanks for that, Rachel. Lizzie? Um, I don't see in this particular report the list of the um, organizations and entities that we were inviting to the group. So maybe we can make that available to the commission at some point so, um, so that it, it answers more of Christian's question um, and shows that it's reflective of not so much individual diversity, but uh, like this, the organizations um, and that represent the diversity of our community. Definitely. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. And I, I do have to echo Lizzie's comments. This group worked incredibly hard to make this document happen um, and are continuing to still work very hard to get the survey done. Um, so thank you for all of that. Gabe? Okay. Jamie, I see uh, Lieutenant Hill turn on his camera and I didn't know if he wanted to also oh. speak. Thank you, because I right. cannot see everyone's face. No problem. Hi, everybody, uh, and thanks for uh, uh, letting me say something. First of all, um, I don't want anything to say to uh, um, devalue the work that was put into this because I am also super appreciative and I love the fact that there's a partnership with uh, a research university because I support uh, researcher practitioner partnerships. Um, the only thing that uh, I noticed just for consideration was under membership. Um, I know that there's been um, a lot of thought put into uh, eligibility of former, et cetera, law enforcement. And it did, um, I did note that uh, the, there were some questions regarding, um, or that state, are there any requirements or limitations that would make you more comfortable with their involvement? And it did catch me by surprise because there's a, an explicit um, inference that someone's not comfortable with the involvement. I just say that for consideration. And again, uh, please don't misinterpret that to um, devalue the work that was put into this because I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Lucy. Um, thank you for mentioning that, Sean. That was a, a concern of Lieutenant Hill. Sorry, that was a, a concern. I don't know about a concern, but a, a question I had too, just unsure if that word comfortable was a leading um, statement or leading um, um, suggestion that folks were uncomfortable. And, and, I'm not, and I know that in our conversations, we were trying to come up with different words that would, you know, to replace comfortable. Uh, any suggestions? <laughs> Rich? Well, isn't the, the current recommendation is that they are not. So I think the idea of it saying like, is there something that we could do to make them more comfortable to change that? So I, to me, it seems that it is in line with what is currently being recommended. That's my two cents. Thank you, Rich. Okay, thank you everyone. I appreciate all the comments and the focus group is, is because they do meet several times a week are meeting again tomorrow. So they can take um, all of those comments and recommendations um, in, into um, consideration as they finalize and we move forward on, on everything. So thank you. Um, Gabe, I'll turn it back over to you. Perfect, thank you, Cami. And thank you everyone on that work group. 
um, it, it has been a lot of work and you all have done amazing. So uh, Sam, if we could open up public comment on this item, if there are members that would like to give public comment on the outreach materials. Sure. Um, if anybody in the public has any questions or comments related, any comment related to the re number five review of outreach materials, please raise your hand. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on item five review of outreach materials, please raise your hand. There are no hands raised, Chair. Thank you, Sam. So we'll close out item five and we'll move on to item six, which is a review of the legal memo from the city attorney's office. The Community Formation Commission will discuss the legal review of the draft recommendation language done by the city attorney's office. And I believe we have John Doimus here to give a presentation and uh, lead our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Escobedo. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, I'm happy to be here to provide this recommendation. I, I want to first start off by apologizing uh, for the lateness of it. I know you only had a couple hours to review the memo. Fortunately, there isn't really ma any major conflicts uh, <laughs> for us to discuss. There's basically three. Um, and that's what I'll go over in today's presentation. At the end, I'll also discuss, um, I wouldn't classify them as pitfalls, but just issues for the commission to be aware of. They aren't conflicts at all, but I just wanted to point uh, some other issues out for the commission and, and, and answer any questions. Uh, and feel free to, to reach out to me if you have additional questions after this. I know, um, again, the commission only had a couple hours uh, to review my memo. Uh, the memo also for members of the public have been, and the PowerPoint have been posted on to our website. Um, so with that, I will start off. Next slide, please, Sam. So first, I just wanted to start off in, in reviewing the draft recommendations and being part of these meetings uh, over the past of almost a year. Uh, you deserve extreme uh, acknowledgement for your achievement. Uh, I have never saw a commission deal with such a, a dense uh, subject matter and, and, and come out in such a short time. Uh, with recommendation. You've all become subject matters <laughs> experts in this area and you should be applauded for that. Uh, and we met less than a year. I remember our first meeting, I was in Chicago at that time in a hotel room on March 17th. Uh, so uh, in that you produce the draft to go out to the public. Uh, I just want to point out this review. I was very careful in this review. I, I acknowledge what the commission asked, just to spot conflicts. I'm not doing an evaluation uh, on the merits of any uh, recommendation. It's just to discuss conflict issues or, or just other pitfalls, as we say. Uh, next slide, please. So one issue is uh, deals with the Brown Act. The other two issues are more of a, uh, a charter uh, issue. Um, now, this issue hasn't been 100% solidified. I've spoken to some, reached out to some people. Cami's helped introduce me to a couple of people too uh, on this issue. So uh, there may be more to come. But here's a potential Brown Act issue. As you see in your draft recommendation, section five provides that the board will meet in closed session when discussing and reviewing the details of a personnel file permitted by law. So the commission does have a caveat there and I acknowledge that. Um, now the most common closed session items that we have are allowed to under the Brown Act, are real estate negotiations, discussing litigation, labor negotiation and personnel matters. Um, now the commission does have in there uh, and the recommendations, the ability to recommend discipline. And if that was part of, um, was to be held as re review of a case file that included in that discussion would be to recommend discipline. I don't foresee a Brown Act issue, but as I'll get to later, there is an issue for the ability of the commission to recommend discipline. So if we are not able to recommend discipline, are we able to go into closed session? Uh, I, I do not believe the Brown Act would allow us to go into closed session to review an investigation, to review the thoroughness or anything else like that. Um, commissions that do, generally also have the power to recommend discipline and that's how they're able to do that. Uh, again, I wanna reach out to more agencies in the city to see how they interpret that section of the Brown Act. But as of, as of today, uh, if we're not able to recommend discipline, uh, the commission 
that would be performed, not able to recommend discipline. I don't think they can view such material items or have a discussion in closed session because it's not a discussion in personnel matters. Now, uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to get into what, what, what we're allowed to, what the specific is. So the government code authorizes um, the ability in closed session to discuss personnel issues, including complaints or charges made against an employee. So we could receive a complaint against an employee, but the disposition of the investigation or, 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 uh, or you're recommending discipline is something different, right? So reviewing an investigation isn't necessarily receiving a complaint. So that's the one issue we have on that. Um, as I mentioned before, the civilian review boards that do have a closed session uh, under government uh, do so because they can recommend discipline because they follow the government code procedure on that. There may be more to come on that, as I mentioned, but it, it seems that the commission wouldn't be able to review at least investigations uh, in closed session. That would have to be done in open session. Next slide, please. Um, and so finally, I just wanted to present what the actual language is in the government code section. Uh, as you'll notice on my memo too, uh, if there is a closed session held under the evaluation performance of discipline, the employee is required to receive notice at least 24 hours before holding the session. So if there ever was a way for the commission, and that may include a charter amendment to do so um, for holding such thing, the, the employee affected by this must receive notice. Uh, but the language in there, uh, I wanted to read the language or at least point out the language for the commission from the government code that talks about the appointment, employment, evaluation of important um, performance, discipline, um, for employee to hear complaints or charges brought against that employee, right? So again, just reviewing an investigation or case file may not be enough to, to hold a closed session in that item. And feel free the commission if they have any questions afterwards or during um, the presentation to uh, for me to address. And Sam, just let me know if anyone's raising their hands since I can't see see everybody. Next next slide, please. Uh, a next issue that I noticed a potential conflict is actually for uh, a charter conflict. It's the ability to contract for services. Um, the uh, subsection 10 part two of uh, the uh, uh, recommended draft says that the uh, board shall have the ability uh, to uh, to contract with the, and I apologize for a second because my screen is cut off, internet connection. Hold on one second. Let me get to that. Uh, the ability to direct the uh, 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 police oversight to contract with outside legal counsel or investigations as necessary. Um, this recommendation is inconsistent with two charter sections, section 518 and section 703. And I'll go into explain why. Sam, next slide, please. So section 703 of the charter provides that the powers and duties of the city attorney's office. And in that section, it goes in part to say that it's a city attorney's office or city attorney itself, actually, not the city attorney's office, can represent and advise the city council and all city officers in matters of law pertaining to their offices. Then 703 goes on to say that the city council shall have control of all legal business and proceedings and may employ other attorneys to take charge or may contract for any prosecutions, litigations, or other uh, legal matters or business. So any contracting with legal counsel must be undertaken and approved by the city council. So that's not to say that the commission uh, can't do this or, or, or can't contract with a lawyer if there's a conflict um, to do that, but they have to go through approval of the city council's uh, route must be done on a, a agendized item. So there's a process, it can't be done internally. It would have to go directly to city council and that would have to be done in a publicly agendized meeting uh, to approve of such legal services. So that could be simply as um, why it's needed and the approval and, and the budgetary approval of that, Again, just so it can't be done on its own. Uh, next slide, please. And then there's five, section 518 of the city charter. And that section basically provides the process of um, uh, how a contract may be, may be uh, um, commence in the city. Uh, in that it says that all contracts shall be approved by city council, the mayor, the clerk's office, uh, and in order to legitimize a contract must be, must be signed and authorized uh, by the city council or may authorize a city administrator to bind the city. Um, so we've had that issue before where people have tried to say, 
um, promissory estoppel. That's a legal term that someone has made a, a promise uh, to engage in basically through their words or actions have bind the city to a contract. No, um, we've had cases on that, we litigated it and won. Uh, the charter creates the rule of how we are bound to a contract. It's either through the city administrator or through the city council. Through the city administrator, the city administrator has the ability to enter into a contract less than $35,000 in services, the city council above that. Uh, if a contract initially starts at the city administrator's approval threshold of less than 35, but needs to be amended to go over it, eventually that would have to go seek council approval. And with that, all I'm pointing out in, in, in this, it's a minor, like I say, a minor conflict. It may already be contemplated by the commission. That position can't itself um, direct a contract or establish a contract. It must seek city administrator approval. And if we're going over uh, 35,000, there must be council approval. So um, the, the that position or, or the board may help facilitate a contract. The execution of it still has to go through the city process per the city charter. Next slide, please. Here's the most, probably the most major conflict that we have and most certain conflict we have in terms of the recommendations. Uh, it's on recommending the discipline of the hiring and firing of the uh, director of police oversight. And it's also for uh, recommending discipline to any police officer. Um, section two of the draft recommendation provides the CEOB, which is the, um, the commission oversight body, shall be involved in the hiring and firing process of the director of police oversight. And section eight provides that, um, that at the end that based on the review of an incident or, or a, uh, a review of an investigation that, um, that they can recommend discipline to the, uh, to the chief of police. Uh, next slide, please. There's a concern that this would be in a violation of our city charter. There's actually a case in 1976 um, that kind of is on point to this issue. Uh, and that issue, the um, uh, city of Berkeley, as many know, developed a, a, a commission to uh, review uh, police conduct or police review commission. Uh, and they did it by ordinance. Uh, in that they also had the ability to recommend discipline. Um, the court invalidated that part of the ordinance. A taxpayer brought a lawsuit before the court. And um, it said there where the ordinance empowered a police review commission to intervene in disciplinary proceedings against individual police department employees. Uh, it was in, in violation of the city charter uh, and could not be done so. And so an amendment to the city charter would have to be undertaken to do that. Next slide, please. And so John, we have a, yes. John, I have a question on that last one. I, I'm not, I think, I think you're describing a situation where the, the commission would have say in police department staff, but that's not what this, that's not what this recommendation is saying. It's saying it has um, to be involved in the hiring process of the director of police oversight. Correct. I, I did see uh, Commissioner Rodriguez. I did, but I also did see the, the firing language. So the hiring, being part of the process is fine. And I, I think I think that's that's key in terms of, uh, for example, what we do with the police chief. You know, if we want to create a um, uh, a body of like different. Uh, um, um, different groups to review what we do with the police chief. Uh, that's fine, sitting in different interview panels and then giving the city administrator input on that. That's perfectly perfectly appropriate. I definitely would avoid termination. That's That would be in conflict. So I wouldn't, you know, there is a process to do input on um, being an interview panel. I don't think anything is wrong or a conflict on that, but being part of the disciplinary process and, um, Having that uh, would, would be problematic with the city charter, as I'll explain in a second. Um, how, about, how about the wording of um, review? So hiring and the review process of this position. I, I, I also think as I'll get into it, I, I'll explain why in a second. I also think review would be a potential conflict with the city charter. Uh, I, I think the, the hiring process and setting the standards, but then once that becomes an employee of the city, that is an employee of the city and it would be under the jurisdiction of the city administrator or if it was a department, the department head and a supervisory manager. A commission should be really hands-off 
on that process. And I'll, and I'll explain why in, in, in a second. Um, and, and definitely with clears to not be able to make, make recommendations of any discipline of a police department employee. So the reason for that is here as we read in section 607 of the city charter. And as you see here, it says, except otherwise provided in the charter, neither the council nor any of its members shall order directly or indirectly. Indirectly is a very key word because that can be interpreted reasonably as recommendation, right? The appointment by the city administrator or by any of the department heads in the administrative service of the city or any person to any office or employment, so that means the city employees or his removal therefrom, right? And so what this, what this charter section basically says is, you know, city council, you basically get to, when you read the charter, you get to hire and fire two employees. You're in charge of two employees and that's the city administrator and the city attorney. Outside of that, you're hands off. You can't influence, you can't directly or indirectly influence the appointment or the hiring or firing of any, any city employee. And certainly if the city council can't do that. A subsequent commission and a subordinate, I do mean that with respect, but city council is the highest uh, legislative body in the city can do that. And, and we would face a legal challenge and, and lose because there's direct language in the charter uh, on that. So, so I would have great concern of any commission reviewing, being part of the performance evaluation and, and indirectly uh, affecting the discipline or termination of an employee. Uh, I, I do think having an interview panel, we do with the chief getting community needs input was part of that. I don't think that's, that's problematic, but when you're talking about performance evaluations, reviews and termination, because then you're talking about due process and property rights of an employee. And then they can point to this charter section and say, by the commission's involvement about my employment now that I've been hired, uh, by them reviewing me or recommending discipline, or certainly a police uh, um, department employee could point to this and saying that this isn't permitted in the charter. And let me go on to the next charter section okay. too. Quick question. Sure, sure. Um, could you explain more about that last section where it says this section should not apply to any officer appointed by the city council? Like what officer is that referring to? The city administrator and the city attorney. Those, those are the exact two positions. Yep. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, John, oh, go ahead, Demo. Dem sorry. Yeah, so, so it's saying this section as in like the, the, the city council can't, because you just because I, I think I've interpreted that wrong. Can you explain what this section is? Is it talking about what we just read or the authority to like like influence? So 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 basically what it, what it what it means is that the, the city council can't be involved in the personnel uh, matters of the city for all for all its employees, uh, except when it comes to uh, what's provided in the, in the city charter. And what's provided to them in the city charter are, are three, three exceptions, right? They're able to deal with the hiring and firing of a city administrator. They're able to, and that's explicitly provided in the city charter. They're able to deal with the hiring and firing of the city attorney. And the okay. third area is when the city administrator appoints a department head uh, or wants to remove a department head, they are consulted in that process in closed session. So those are the three three areas. Outside of that, the city council can't basically uh, affect directly or indirectly, meaning hiring or or, rec or making recommendations to the employment or, or uh, termination or discipline of any other city employee. Yeah. So that that's that's how we would do that charter section. Okay. So there's it's just it's just basically like it's saying there's a layer like they can't directly influence the people under them, but they can, they they have authority over their their superiors basically they, they, they can't they can't yes i mean a lot of city charter well, a lot of cities have adopted charters similar to this that's why berkeley had one um you, you start worrying about patronage and other things and so the public when the, when the public voted for the city charter they were worried about issues like that like you know you can do a tammany hall and start uh hiring your friends and everything else to be part of this right so that's actually one of the big things what this section does. It's like city council, you, you get to you get to hire and fire two positions and consult it on the department heads, but you, you're not involved in any other process, right? And, and it also protects public employees 
from the political um, swings, right? Uh, uh, in terms of patronage, like, okay, if I didn't support this candidate or, or, or I'm not part of a political machine, now I can worry about getting fired yeah. if I'm an assistant city attorney or if I'm a custodian or anything else. So that that's the intent of this section. Right, yeah, that's exactly but, what I was asking, the intent, because it could be interpreted as, as they're saying, okay, well, we just don't want to deal with, like, it's hard to manage all that. So, so we just have these two people. You know what I mean? It's an interpretation. Sure. So yes, that's your interpretation, but it's like it could be interpreted differently. I understand, Commissioner Adam Lincoln. Yes, and, and a lot, and a lot of that is interpreted to prevent like patronage issues. You know, the Tammany Hall, the famous days in New York, all these things with that. But within, because of that, then it cre to to recommend discipline to have a, a board or a body recommend discipline now creates a conflict because council is prohibited. Ergo, any subsequent commission or board would be prohibited unless it's explicitly allowed in the city charter and that would be have to be the vote without the people and that would make sense right um no one no one wants the, the citizens and, and the public do not want a, a a city staff or government influenced by patronage issues right and so uh but if they felt that a commission should have viewpoint on city employees um, the only way to override that would be creating a creating a charter amendment to allow maybe the specific uh, exception to that rule. Um, and let me get out. If there are any other further questions, I want to get into the second part that also solidifies why we couldn't make recommendations or or um, hiring or firing, a d direct hiring or firing of a of a uh, of a position. Next slide, please. So section 604 of the city charter um, basically is under the, uh, delineates the powers of the city administrator. And in there it talks about what the city administrator has the power to do and the point promote, suspend, remove all department heads, officers, employees of the city. Uh, uh, so with that, and they can authorize the department head to do that. So, you know, being, being part of the review or the recommended process, a city employee uh, could bring a challenge to that. I think a successful legal challenge because the, the power to review, to the power to promote, suspend, and, and remove, and promotion is part of the review process, right? So that's why it's key, is, is, is held in the sole jurisdiction of the city administrator or who the city administrator <laughs> delegates. And it has to be department heads, officers, or other employees. Can't be a board. So if a commission was part of a uh, review process. And that review process affected a, a promotion on, on, a, on a, a step, and let's say it's a civil service step or whatever it could be. Uh, uh, an employee could bring a challenge to saying that the commi a commission uh, should not have any role in that. that. That's specifically delegated in the charter to the city administrator or any uh, department heads or employees, uh, he or she chooses to do so. So that's, that's why, a commission um, that's being proposed can obviously discipline, make recommendations or disciplines, or at least, or, or, or do performance evaluations or review of that uh, employee because it would be a reconflict with the charter. Any questions on that issue? I just still think it's like, it's, I, still, I still think there's like room for interpretation in there. understood <laughs> i respect that just my point. that's just my point I, I i don't think it's that i think legally that could be interpreted in different ways that's just my opinion so. and then uh next slide please john yeah. there are a couple of questions oh oh yeah absolutely please please uh yes. chair i know you were waiting to ask a question before i'm happy to let you go first Thanks, Christian. Um, John, it, I know I asked you this before the meeting, but it was helpful for me. Um, so in our current recommendations, it refers to um, recommending discipline. How, how does this current provision or the couple of provisions that you brought up in the city charter relate mm -hmm. to agreeing or disagreeing with discipline that was issued? Sure. Versus a recommendation. Uh, 
I understood. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Escobedo um, and Commission. That uh, So recommending discipline, when you look at Section 607, which I think is slide 11, Sam, if you go back, you really key on the word um, directly or indirectly, right? And indirectly would be viewed as rec recommending because uh, a commission recommending discipline obviously is influential, provides influence to that. Uh, and um, let's let's say the recommendation of a uh, let's say a recommendation of a commission is to uh, terminate this employee, right? And the police chief, you know, whether you know agreed. Yeah, I, I agree. And that rec recommendation is there and written and, and done. Employee could point to the charter and say a conflict that the chief followed the recommendation of the commission and uh, he is unable to do so in the charter. He, he basically, um, indir the commission indirectly affected my employment uh, as a city employee. So, so even by recommending can be construed as indirectly affecting the, the uh, the employment status in terms of that employee. And so if, if council, as I mentioned before, if council is unable to do so, uh, certainly a, a new commissioner body wouldn't have that ability to. And, and that was the issue again at the Berkeley case that the commission could you know, recommend or issue, they could do both discipline. And, and by doing so, the, the taxpayer that brought a writ of mandamus, a writ is asking a judge to basically order a city to not to do the action that they plan on taking. So basically invalidate that ordinance. Uh, and the judge agreed that this is in conflict because in that case, um, discipline was under the sole jurisdiction or sole control of the city administrator, such as how we have it uh, written in our charter. And, and by doing that, by delegating that responsibility to, a, to commission would be in violation of that because the commission is not an officer or another employee of the city. So, so if I may, if I can ask, um, in the example that you gave, the commission would give a recommendation before the chief of police decided on um, discipline. What about if the commission just opined on the discipline that was given by the chief of police after, at the end of the process rather than before, so they're not influencing the actual decision itself? Commissioner Acevedo, that's an excellent question. And um, um, then I think at that point, you have a due process issue and an internal process issue, right? Because you're opining on that and your, your commission legislative body that's affecting the employment of a city employee and he has no opportunity to be heard or, or, or basically argue the merits of it before this commission, especially such an influential you know, opinion. Plus, you're also dealing with a conflict issue because after the chief um, issues a discipline and after a Skelly hearing, the appeal process is in the strict jurisdiction of the Civil Service Commission. They are the ones that then decide whether the the, the, the discipline is uh, uh, should be sustained or not. So um, that that's the other conflict because that would, then all of a sudden you're going into the jurisdiction of the Civil Service Commission. So I we would probably would have a conflict on that. So then uh, last question, I promise, um, is, okay, so those two are off the table, but then if we wanted to maybe look at discipline, maybe separate from the specific case itself, but look at discipline trends, we could do that, correct? Absolutely. Could, okay. okay. Absolutely, uh, Chair Escobedo and Commission, absolutely. If it's not tied to any individual, and you could look at discipline trends, you could look at a, a matrix in terms of, um, you know, without tying it to any specific employee, here are policy violations, this is what the recommended, this is what the sustained discipline has been over a period of time, um, you know, going past 10, 15 years or into the future, absolutely. Th th that's not, that is in no way conflict to the city charter. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Alonzo, I see your hands raised. Yeah, I think, and you bring, you bring up a really great point, Chair, um, and I wonder if we should change the language or amend the language to, to make that a specific function of the Civilian Oversight Board if we are in conflict and, like, can't uh, make recommendations about discipline, but reviewing, like, some specific language about reviewing aggregate disciplinary data and uh, like transmitting findings 
to the chief of police, city council, whoever, about those findings. I would like to see language like substituted for this. This if we if we can't do this, like uh, if the COB can't do this, then I would like to see that language substituted. So I'm I'm hoping that after we get the um, the conflicts um, summary, that we can kind of go back and look at how we can change some of the language in this particular um, situation. I'm wondering, would it be appropriate for the um, COB to not not make in lieu of discipline recommendations have a report that maybe indicates the the level of um, of egregiousness. So um, so it's not saying we you know that this body believes this person should be on administrative leave for ninety days, but maybe this this body believes that this level of um, uh, misconduct reaches a severity that terms that deems you know stern discipline could could it could it be like that sort of vague but related to uh, Cabello, commissioner rodriguez I, my my opinion on the matter is i i would entirely avoid anything when it comes to Discipline and in terms of not even language, not not even uh, Chair uh, Commissioner Alonzo has a good point. You can you can definitely create language in terms of reviewing trends to see if there's uh, disparate impact, disparate treatment of employees internally. But you can also look at um, uh, trends in terms of uh, um, whether the, whether the levels in the past or current for particular violations. Um, you know, are just, but when you come to an individual employee, you know, even saying that this deserves stern, stern discipline, it, that could still be worded as indirectly um, uh, affecting, you know, the uh, being part of that process, you know, and being influential. So, so to me, I look at how the, how the charter is phrased, the language in there, and how it, how it really makes it the purview of the city administrator and the city administrator's subordinates. That that's within that sphere, and, and any language by any any body, legislative body, um, when it comes to discipline, is uh, would be in violation because an employee can make a very compelling argument that um, it, it's indirectly affecting affecting my employment by having such a language in there. When you're saying it should be stern, well, it's going to be I'm, it's going to be a loss to me, whether it's a long suspension or a termination. Um, and to point out, I don't have a slide up there, but the, you know, the Civil Service Commission um, also does that in terms of they, there's language that the commission could look at and it's similar to the fire and police when, when he talks about recommend and I urge the commission to look at that, I can um, post that. But they also are, are, are tasked with not only making, listening to hearings or appeals of employees, but recommend, making recommendations to policies, employment conditions, you know, and, 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 and even when it comes to, you know, is there, is there just discipline being issued in terms of, does the, does the punishment mean the crime, essentially, when it comes to the police department? So um, they have that, that kind of power and review to make such recommendations. Um, and, and the same body can do that with the, with the oversight board, too. Um, you know, if it's not mandated solely within the Fire and Police Commission, which I'll, I mean, the Civil Service Commission, which I'll get into, there's no conflict there. So there would be no conflict for the commission to make, uh, you know, you know, basically creating a penalty matrix. You know, that would be one, one example, a recommended penalty matrix. But when it comes to individual employees, um, that's prohibited, at least in conflict with the charter. I believe Rich Sander has a question or comment. So I'm I'm trying to understand this in the way that you laid it out, Mr. Doimus. Does this mean that under the charter, that any employee of the city, like uh, me as a citizen, if I was dealing with an employee of the city and I was having trouble with them, I couldn't complain to their manager about it like that. With no, no, it, Commissioner it, Senator, No, no. Anyone can make a complaint. What would, what would the process with? Let's say a citizen would make a complaint. Uh, the complaint would go to HR, they would investigate and, and they discipline. So all, all I'm so saying could is- a, Could our board make a complaint or no? 
Well, well, the board is there to uh, receive receive complaints from citizens, right? So if there's a, if there's misconduct, they're there and they're re, they're to review the quality of uh, investigation. But no, a board, I'm saying, like, could our board make a complaint of the director of OPO to the city administrator or something? If there was something that was instead of the review process, oh, I, I understand. Yes, can we it, make it, a complaint? Should, a, a, absolutely. So if, let's let's say there was a let's say um, the board had a, had an issue with the that that employee, they can make a complaint. But then then it's a, it's up to the city administrator how they deal with that and dole out whatever it may be. Then it's but but absolutely, there's no problem making a complaint with that with that position. Absolutely. So the 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 legal part that we're saying here is that we can't be involved in the review process per se, but if we do have some recourse, if there was uh, some decisions that were happening from the director of OPO that the board was not happy with, the board could make complaints to the city administrator to do something about it. The board can make that too. I, I also think the board, I, I don't want to be strict, and I apologize if I seem so strict in this part. I, I don't think the, the, I don't think the board is precluded from um, the city administrator, whoever that position is getting input, right? And as part of the evaluation process, I think that's um, important. So I, maybe Commissioner Rodriguez is pointing out to that. I, I, I don't, uh, getting trying to get to that point. I don't think there's anything wrong with receiving input and, and getting input uh, should the city administrator choose. But, you know, mandating it or having it directly like, uh, T tied in, in terms of uh, part of the process, could be could be problematic, right? And that's that's the getting input from a board on the review is is the least of my concerns when I look at the charter. The biggest the biggest stay away the biggest stay away is the discipline, right? Recommending discipline of any city employee. That's the biggest stay away. That's where you're going to have issues, right? If, if a commission is part of the review process, city administrator is doing a poor performance evaluation and sends out a handout, hey, I want to get your input on this to see how this position is doing. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about a legal challenge on that either. That's just good management practice. And I don't think that you're going to find really a, a big issue from a charter conflict. But if the commission ties a written recommendation after it does a review that this employee should be terminated and they are indeed terminated, you better believe we're going to face a legal issue and a problem on that. So that's where that's where I want to make a clear distinction on that. And I apologize if that didn't come across as clear. That that is where my more of an area of concern we need we need to be uh, on this. Sorry, yeah, and I think that's a valid concern. And the way you just explained that makes perfect sense to me now. Um, my issue earlier was just um i feel like the like understanding the intent of you know the role like not to interfere with the administrative administrative service i understand that but i also think there's like a balance between like you know upholding the charter and also allowing for just making the process work properly following the rules but also ensuring there's accountability like you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, absolutely. The, the intent has to be, it can't just be that, you know, there's, you can't, like, I know what the letter of the law is, but I'm sure the intent also would imply some accountability. And as long as we figure out how to do it in a way that follows the letter of that law, that's, that's what I'm trying to get to, you know. Sure. Can, Commissioner Adam, I'll leave that, you know, that, that's a good point. And I guess the best way to phrase this is I'm doing this memo and trying to put this all together. He, he, here's where, here's how I divide it in two, two camps. Issue one is this, a, a border commission could be part of the uh, facilitation process, getting input of what we want for this position, right? Or, um, uh, or, or getting input from the city administrator on a performance evaluation. That, that is not a, that is not a problem. The, that, get that dealing with that facilitation, but the ultimate call of the review of that employee, whether they get promoted, they're, the person that signs that performance evaluation or the person that makes the hiring decision at the end is the city administrator or the employee that the city administrator dele delegates that to, whether it's the department sense. head. That, that's exactly it. The second camp is discipline. Discipline is a whole different area versus when you want to hire or you want to do an evaluation on that. When you're recommending discipline of a city department employee or even a city, another city employee in terms of the uh, uh, the, the the officer you know who assists the uh, community uh, board, that 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 is problematic. And the influence of saying this 
employee should be suspended or fired does create a conflict that I could see really challenged successfully. And it wasn't in, in Berkeley um, uh, on that. So that, that's, that's the issue I would avoid. So, so that's okay. how I would summarize, summarize it. So sorry, and, and, you the first part. You said the second part was discipline. What was the first part? The first part is that commission can, you know, be part of the input process or the hiring process, being part of a panel, right? Being, you know, if, if a city administrator wants to solicit opinions on a, the performance evaluation uh, of the director of oversight, absolutely, that's fine. That's fine. The city administrator, though, is the ultimate person responsible, though, for the performance evaluation and hiring that employee. That's that's delegated in the charter. But there can be input from the commission in terms of the review and, and the hiring decision. Uh, but when it comes to issuing discipline, that's where it's you know a commission should really should avoid that area based on the language in the charter. Okay, so due process doesn't affect the first part, though, right? Like that wouldn't. No, be no. Due, that's a really good question. Due due, due process is public employees uh, besides that are in the civil service system or, or, or even not have, because uh, they have a name clearing hearing, have a, a, expect, a, a property interest because they have an expectation of continued employment. And so when you're hiring someone, there's no property interest yet because they haven't gotten the job. But when they're hired, then there's that property interest because that, the expectation of continued employment begins. So when you're talking about terminating someone or suspending someone, that interrupts that that property interest, and that and that's that's where where our due process must be given to that employee. That makes sense. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So I guess we just have to write it in a way that makes a distinction between that those two, like the the the, the disciplinary section. And then the, if we just, we could frame it in a way that ensures that we uh, like don't conflict with that, but also ensures that there's like that input and like, like there's like an, a system of accountability in that process. Maybe it, it doesn't have to touch the disciplinary part, but at least to understand what happened or, or like the hiring process. Is you know, a, it, 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 it's, a very, it's, it's a very minor change in terms of what you've, uh, Commissioner Menelik and what you have, right? The one minor, the one change would be uh, eliminating recommending discipline of um, let me get to it. There's two there's two minor uh, changes. Section section eight, it's the last uh, it's the last part uh, uh, in terms of recommending the chief police chief of police administrative action, including possible discipline for such personnel. That that's the one elimination. Everything else is, is fine. And then the other part of section two involved in the firing process. Hiring process is fine. But the the hiring firing process of the director of police oversight is what eliminate that. That's it. I wouldn't I wouldn't touch anything else okay. on that. That's the only thing I view as conflict. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And I I know I know it. Yes, it's it's a very uh, um, it's a very interesting issue because what seems very confusing about it is that, you know, the Fire and Police Commission is in, involved in interview panels and there shouldn't be, you know, and, and we do want community input of what the next police chief will be, should be, what qualities or, or qualifications we're looking for um, yeah. and, and other, other things. And, and, and that's not, you know, if, if, if we were prohibited from that, you know, then, you know, because of a conflict then how, how would that go about? I'm not saying that's a conflict. It, it really, it really isn't. Uh, but when, when someone's filling out a performance evaluation and then signing it, or someone's recommending discipline, that that's where the conflict lies. So I just want to make that point clear. Any other questions as to those points? Great, uh, Sam. I think we were in slide uh, thirteen. So as I, as I mentioned, um, those are the two charter. Uh, those two charter provisions provide the city administrators tasked with appointing and removing employees. Uh, city administrator can definitely get input in terms of appointing. Uh, removing is very difficult. Uh, I would avoid, at least in terms of the charter language. Uh, if, if there are issues with an employee, as Commissioner Sander uh, said, that Sander said, that that's different. If if someone's not employing well, that a complaint could be brought to a city administrator, whoever does supervise that employee. There's no issue in that. But in terms of seeing that discipline process or that complaint process through that must be in the sole purview of the city administrator uh, and as i mentioned the reason why we have that language historically to prevent patronage or firing employees because of you know uh, a legislative body doing that to, to you know because of political issues or, or politicizing that so if council can't do that can't be delegated to lesser body that's not to say a charter amendment 
can't rectify that. Uh, if it was specifically put in city charter language, and obviously we've gone over the process for that, then it can. But since it's in the charter, we're not allowed to do that. Um, next slide, please. So the good news is those are the only minor conflict issues that uh, I found, right? The issue of discipline, the issue in, in the minor issue, which I don't think the commission really um, cares too much about because they probably have this idea, but the contracting issue, you can contract for services, but if it's for legal services, it must be approved by city council. And if it's for um, all else, you must get city administrator approval if it's under 35, city council for over 35. I don't think that causes too much consternation. Uh, the commission wanted to do that. And the final one was the Brown Act one that I still want to do further, further look into that. But if we're just looking at the results of investigation, the quality investigation, um, solely looking at that, I, I don't believe that can be done in closed session. Those are the three main issues. What I'm going to get into now is what I call non-conflict issues, just to point out some things, um, uh, my legal opinion on the matter, but it can stay, it cannot stay, it can be adjusted. I don't view it as all as a conflict. Um, then there's two. One is under Section E in investigations. There it provides that if an investigation is deemed deficient after returning it for a second time, I think we'll get to why that could be a problem. Um, the DPO can refer the matter to the uh, to the board. Upon review, the poor board upon two thirds majority vote can direct the uh, DPO to work with the city administrators to contract with an independent investigator to conduct an independent investigation. My concern with that is the timeliness of all that. We're coming back a second time working on a contract and here's why. Next slide, please, Sam. Uh, the government code, which is the uh, Police Officer Bill of Rights POBAR, provides a one-year statute of limitations for bringing disciplinary action um, against a public safety officer. Uh, there are some exceptions like uh, if it's a criminal matter, workers' comp fraud, but generally for the majority of our cases, that one-year period um, begins from the agency's discovery of alleged misconduct. That could be a supervisor discovering something, or that could be a complaint brought in by a citizen uh, of an uh, uh, individual of misconduct. And, uh, and once we have that, we have one year to issue discipline. So my only concern is if we have a process like that, uh, can we get in the one, can we meet the one year statute of limitation? That's all I'm pointing out. It's, it's just maybe something for the commission to mull over um, on that issue. That, that's my only concern on, on that. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, this is not a conflict. I'm just pointing out why actually the commission is, uh, what the Fire and Police Commission does and why they're able, uh, and why the commission can, can cover the same ground. So as you see there in section 816, the city outlines the powers and duties of the Fire Commission. And I have highlighted words there, advisory capacity, recommend, make recommendations, as you can see on all those sections. Nothing in there provides a, a, a mandatory duty. Right. That, that the, and what I mean by that is the Fire Police Commission makes a recommendation that City Council or the Police Department is mandated to follow that. Because it's not a mandated uh, duty, um, we can have an overlapping power. So you, and, and you do have that in your recommendation. And there is no conflict presented in that. So you, you can cover the same grounds. I just wanted to make aware of what the Fire Police Commission does. They have similar powers. But if people, if the commission or members of the public were interested in this issue, there is no inherent conflict because um, it's, it's, there's no mandatory duties. This is all permissive in terms of making recommendations. And there are no issues with two, two legislative bodies making, uh, making recommendations over one department. And with that, that is uh, my presentation. And I'm happy to address any more questions the commission may have. Commissioner Lanza? Yes, thank you, Mr. Doimus. Um, the <clears throat> section about the closed session, just so I, my understanding is correct, this can easily be amended, I suppose, and remove the conflict if we're reviewing the investigations in open session. Uh, so basically, to comply with the Brown Act, I'm wondering if we're further limited 
by discussing an investigation by Hobar, um, or if we're if if we if we just take out the closed session language, we would be in compliance with the Brown Act and with Pobar with Pobar. That's, that's a really good question. So um, the act the act so Penal Code Section eight thirty two point seven provides who has access to personnel files, and it talks about uh, you know management, right? Uh, and so that would include obviously a officer of superiors. That would include a city administrator. That would include me as counsel for that, right? I, I have access to, to view that. Um, all cities that hasn't been challenged have interpreted that to include boards or commissions. That's why you, the commission is allowed to have access to such personnel files, right? If they're given that purview to, to review such things. The issue is a lot, most of the majority, all the commissions at least I know, and Cammy, feel free to let me know, have, have um, do these in closed session. And one of the reasons they can, because they can recommend discipline. Uh, I talked, spoke to a, uh, an assistant city attorney up in Oakland and how they do about it is they review all these in closed session, um, but they also could recommend discipline. And so um, my only thing that in there is that the, if we go back to the slide, Sam, on, um, let me, uh, if we go to slide five, What I, what I want to further explore is this. If you see in the first bullet point, B, B1, right? You see up there uh, what you can have in closed session, right? And it goes in appointment, employment, evaluation or performance, discipline or dismissal. Or here's the key part, or to hear complaints or charges brought against an employee by another person, um, unless the employee requests a, a public session, right? So the employee himself could say, you know, I don't want you going to the closed session on this, go in open session. You're talking about me, hold that in open session. I, I want to see that. So they have the right to do that, the employee. And that's why we have to give notice in, in the bullet point below. But what I want to, what I want to focus on or to hear complaints. And to me, I view the complaint process as, look, uh, an investigation is started by receiving a complaint and review it and we sustain it or not. And my hope is the tie-in with that language right there or to hear complaints means we can still hear that in, in, in closed session. I, I haven't found yet a legal opinion on that. I'm, I'm working on that issue. I wanna to continue to work on that. But th that's why I'm saying that little portion may be a little incomplete because my hope is that the ability to, to, to hear or listen to these things can be done in closed or open session if the employee makes a request. So that's why, uh, so that's my hope. If it's not to be interpreted that way, then it would be, would be done so in open session. Thank you. John, do you have an opinion about this as if, because um, I find that very interesting is tying it to that phrase to hear complaints mm -hmm. but i imagine that it would take a little while to uh really analyze it and come to a legal opinion on on the city's behalf of whether or not that's strong enough in a recommendation and eventually an ordinance um it, well, Chesco, oh, sorry for go ahead, go ahead. well trust cabedo now that i've kind of you know Issue spotted, I guess the the uh, draft recommendations and and um, um, we've kind of gone over it. There's really one remaining issue for me. So now I can at least focus my time on one specific. And we as attorneys have what's called a listserv. We can put this out question out to all uh, city attorneys out there, or other things. And and so that's where my focus is. So I think I can at least come to a conclusion and do further research since it's a sole issue now. So I think I can do that in a in a quick and timely manner. And that's what I plan on doing. So it's really well, one issue remains. And one one suggestion I was gonna have is, um, do you see an issue with maybe, maybe we can change the language as it per pertains to this one provision slightly, but going out to public outreach, not changing it too much and waiting for your, your legal opinion on the other side of public outreach to address this particular section. Do you have any concerns with that? Sure, Jessica Beto, actually I have no concerns with the language. I think you can go out because the the the, the language in your draft says as permit, permitted by law. 
right? So, so you're fine how it's incorporated now. So I have no problem with the language in there. I'm, I'm trying to find now the extent or allowed under the law, right? So that's, so I have mm -hmm. no problem with the language. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Chair Lanza. So just so I'm, I'm just so I'm following um, your reading of this um, as far as the the closed session issue is that because the the body cannot partake in disciplinary action uh, even with the section that says to the extent permitted by law effectively because we can't do disciplinary action because of the conflict then it, like the extent permitted by law is like nothing right like it's like there it's not permitted if is, is basically your reading of it do i have that correct you, you you have that correct unless unless to hear complaints qualifies as a basis to hold that and because as, as i mentioned there basically four major areas you can have a closed session right everything else the, the the intent of the legislator when they created the brown act is let the sun shine in right things shouldn't be done in backroom dealings or close it but there's four sensitive areas right one is litigation right the city shouldn't have if they're dealing with litigation being held in public so opposing lawyers can see the strategies or decisions or or, or even settlement discussions. Second is the sensitive nature of land use deals. Um, and, and third being a uh, um, uh, perform, employee performance evaluations or discipline proceedings because of, of the privacy nature of that. So, so if we can't do discipline or reviews on that, uh, I don't know what basis we can have a closed session on that. Right. If we're just reviewing an investigation and the merits of it, whether it should be sustained or not, um, that isn't that's not that's not tied to discipline because the discipline is a separate process. Right. That's that's issued by um, the lieutenant or commander in the police department. Uh, and so um, but what I'm trying to see is to hear complaints since since an investigation was brought forth in the complaint because it originated from there. Would that be a basis to actually review a uh, review that in closed session? Um, so that's that's my understanding, at least of that. So otherwise, we don't have a basis to hear the matter in closed session. There's nothing tying into that. If the commission's not making anything in terms of reviewing this employee or recommending discipline, um, you know, it doesn't fall under the exception of the Brown Act. Okay, and then. Um... I guess as far as the the charter, who in this instance is the disciplinary authority? In terms of um, the the police officer? Yeah, the, like the, the the specific like personnel issue that would that would that would be like the the subject of a closed session of a potential closed session. Well, well, he, he, here's how we've held uh, here's how we've held closed sessions in terms of disciplinary issues or, or appointment or anything else like that. Um, the city administrator or city attorney, their their hiring or evaluation or termination is, is held in closed session by city council. Um, when the um, city administrator wants to appoint or remove a department head, that's held in, in closed session. Um, by the city council. Um, anything outside of that city council uh, does not hear. Now, when it comes to employees uh, in the civil service uh, system, this is how this is done. Um, they're issued a notice of intent to, to let's say, terminate, to, uh, dismiss. Right? They can have a Skelly hearing. After that, uh, they, they go and appeal to the Civil Service Commission. The Civil Service Commission has a hearing, listens to all the witnesses, that reviews the evidence. They then go under the closed session to discuss the discipline, and they're able to do so under this government code provision up on the screen. And so they hold that matter in closed session and then report out. Um, so uh, you only really have two bodies that have really ever heard of uh, disciplinary uh, or any employment issues 
uh, in closed session. That's been the Civil Service Commission and the City Council. No other body does so. And the City Council is limited on who they, who they hear, uh, performance evaluation or, or hire or fire. It's limited to a very small subset of employees. So if, if you have a commission, though, that is allowed to um, make disciplinary recommendations under a charter amendment, if they were allowed to do so, then they could do so in closed session. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Doesn't look like it. Thank Just, you, John. Thank you for that. It was very detailed. We appreciate Great. that. Great. Well, thank you. And if the uh, um, commissioners have any uh, other questions they can think of, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to discuss and and go over it with them in detail. I know I gave this uh, memo today, so you haven't had enough time to digest uh, this. So, um, but I, like I said, it's a tremendous work effort. Uh, you know, I looked through this thoroughly. Uh, you did an excellent job to come with only like three <laughs> three potential conflict issues, and, and two of them, like I said, you probably are were aware of the contracting. Uh, being one, one's on a conflict, one's a Brown Act issue, and then discipline. That's that's tremendous. You, you to be you were to be commended uh, on such a fine work. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for all of your support. This was really helpful. Uh, Sam, if we could open up public comment for this item, and if members of the public um, want to provide public comment, now would be the time. Sure. If anybody has. Um, if anybody in the public would like to speak on item six, the review of the legal memo from the city attorney's office, please raise your hand. If there is anyone in the public that would like to speak on item six, review of the legal memo from the city attorney's office, please click on the hand raise feature. I do not see any hands raised. All right. So with that, we'll close out this item and I think it's about time for us to take a little bit of a break. So let's take a 10 minute recess and we'll come back at 7.15. Thanks everyone.
All right, everyone, we'll reconvene today's meeting at 7.18. And uh, before we move on to our final item tonight, we need to reopen item six uh, to give John a chance to just give a clarification on something. So John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Charles Cabrero. Uh, I, I want to, uh, I think I may have misstated a, a comment I said to uh, Commissioner Alons. I want to make sure. Um, if, if we're not allowed to go into closed session reviewing personnel files, the problem in reviewing personnel files in open session is the public would be able to see that. And then there's the privacy issues uh, uh, of the personnel records under Penal Code 832.7 that would prohibit us. So that's why it's key for me to, to see how um, 54957 can be interpreted and if to hear complaints would justify the basis to go into closed session. And what I plan on doing in the next two weeks, within the next two weeks, is to issue a, a much shorter one-page memo, <laughs> one page and a half, uh, on my findings on that issue um, to the commission as I do outreach to various attorneys uh, up, and, up and down the state. So I just wanted to just clarify that. I think I said that if we can't go into closed session, we can go into open session, but we, we can't because I forgot these personal records are protected. That's why you have to file a pitches motion under 832.7. So I understand the commission's uh, intent and desire to, to uh, hear these in closed session and why they want to do that and uh, the, the issue we face uh, on that. So uh, I will do further research and, and provide that uh, my findings within two weeks. Thank you so much, Chair, for allowing me to uh, provide that clarification. Thank you, John. And John, would you suggest us reopening public comment? Uh, you can for that point, sure to be safe. Yeah, absolutely. So Sam, let's open up public comment for this item and before we close it out. Sure. If there's anyone that would like to speak on item six, review the legal memo from the city attorney's office, please raise your hand. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on item six, review the legal memo from the city attorney's office, please click on the hand raised feature of the Zoom platform. There are no hands raised. Thank you, Sam. So we will close out item six and we'll move on to item seven, which is discussion and review of draft language for the oversight model. The CFC will discuss and review the draft language for the oversight model. The CFC may take action on approving part or all of the language for the purposes of later making a recommendation to the city council. So, um, as stated in the email uh, yesterday, we are going to turn it over to Cami. She's going to lead us through the changes that we have not seen to this point. And then there will be time at the after that to bring up any sections that we want to revisit. And we're hoping that we can approve the language tonight, if possible, so that we can do our outreach. And just remember, we're going to get another um, chance to change any language after the, the outreach effort. So this is not the last time we'll get input on the language. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kenny. Thank you, Gabe. Let me just pull this up. Okay. So as Gabe said, we're just gonna go through those parts of um, the recommendations that we haven't had a chance to talk about language changes. And the language changes that you're gonna see in here tonight and that you saw when you received the document um, yesterday, if you've had a chance to look through it. Um, these are things in the um, introduction and review board section that we didn't go over the last time. And then there are a few things from our review of the Office of Police Oversight section that um, some changes that were made as a result of the conversation we had at your last meeting. So um, with that, I wanna start with this first section, um, which is in the introduction. These changes um, that you'll see in the uh, COB section are from comments that I received prior to our last meeting from individuals who looked over the document and sent me their feedback. Um, and so just so you know where these are coming from. So this, um, the first one is uh, the removal of the word and, and the addition of language to say that, and the desire to proactively establish accountability measures. 
Um, the other change in this paragraph, as you can see, is at the end to um, include in that last sentence that after more than a year of extensive research, deliberations, and community feedback, um, that was inadvertently left out. And it's obviously a major portion of the process that you're engaged in. So um, we put that in there as well. Does anybody have any concerns or comments about these changes? Uh, so it might sound like a little thing, but I just, um, it hasn't been over a year. <laughs> it's been um, uh, 10 months. So I'm just wondering if we could say yeah. nearly a year. Okay. Okay, any other thoughts? Okay, hearing none, I'm gonna go ahead and accept um, these changes. Okay, uh, moving on, the next major change is on page five of the documents. So I'm gonna scroll down there. And this is in the purpose statement. It is just the removal of the word long. So that the statement would now read the Santa Barbara community has called for creating an entity to provide civilian oversight. Any comments, concerns, questions? Okay. Hearing none. We will accept that change as well. The next change is actually um, on page 14. And those, those changes that we just accepted, those were the only changes other than minor gra um, grammatical issues um, that people found in the document um, that were there. So there are no other changes in that section. So this is moving on to um, the OPO section on page 14 is the next. Um, sorry for scrolling through that so fast. Um, okay, section two of duties and authorities um, was the, ad, the, the addition for clarification um, that in collaboration with the COB and the city attorney's office, the OPO shall, based on current established effective civilian oversight practices, create and support a process for the OPO receiving and the SP, SBPD investigating complaints. Just so it's more clear that the investigation when the complaints are first received is done by the SBPD. Any questions? Okay. Okay. So the next section is still in the duties and authorities, um, section four, um, the OPO shall actively in an ongoing basis monitor SBPD's compliance with its own policies, procedures, and governing laws. So in, um, in response to the com comments that um, John had made in the last meeting, um, an additional subsection was added. Um, originally, this talked about uh, uh, issues being, disagreements being resolved by city council, but we changed that to the city administrator because of the information we received at the last meeting. Okay, questions? And please, Sean and Sean, I'm sorry, I haven't been um, calling you out specifically, but please feel free to jump in if you also have any um, questions, comments, concerns. I can, I mean, I don't have any on, on, the, on the changes you, you have presented today. Obviously with my memo, um, mm -hmm. there may be two 
that we can talk about. One in terms of the uh, contracting, which we can revise, and it's, it's, it's a real simple change. And then the, um, the, the firing portion uh, for, for discipline, that's really about it. So I'll let you go through this whole part and then maybe we can go back. I'll okay. point you to those sections at the okay. end. Great, thank you. Amy, this is Sean, I have nothing, thanks for asking. Okay, thank you, Sean. Okay, if there is nothing, hearing nothing, I will go ahead and accept this change. Okay, the next one is understaffing. And so some additional language was added um, to further explain um, the need for the staffing. Um, and so we added language that said to ensure that the Office of Police Oversight is to perform its work thoroughly, timely, and at a high level of competency, adequate resources are necessary. Tammy, can you scroll to that section? Oh, I'm sorry. The problem with working from two screens, my apologies. The other uh, change that you will see in here was the request to add that the director shall be appointed for no less than a four year term so that they're actually there long enough to complete the assessment of the office that you require later in another section. Um, because if they're only there for two or three years, they'll leave before they can actually complete the assessment that's called for. Attorney Doimus, do you see any conflict with that? Uh, not in Commissioner Rodriguez. And then also just to let you know that the, the staffing, um, the first part of that from its work thoroughly, that sentence that we add, portion of the sentence that was added, we took that from the, directly from one of the principles of civilian oversight. So hence the additional footnote. Okay, any questions, comment? Okay, I will go ahead and accept these changes as well. Okay, so the next comes under the hiring in terms of employment. We go down to section five. Um, there was some change for, um, mainly due to comments that were made um, um, by John at the last meeting about who is really able to do those performance evaluations. So uh, the language was simplified by saying the performance of the OPO and director will be reviewed annually and that the annual review of the director will be completed by the city administrator with input from the COB. Then there was some additional information um, added. The director has 30 days to respond to the review. Following the director's review, the review and response shall be sent to the city council and city administrator for their input and response. So, and then, so with, with this, Cami, I have one change. Wait, I'll let, go ahead. I, I'm sorry for interrupting. Oh, no, no, go ahead. So, so part uh, so under five subsection one, I, I'm fine. The annual review, the director will be completed by the city administrator uh, with input um, uh, from the city. And this is this is performance of the OPL, right? So this is the performance of the, the um, that position, correct? Yeah, so one deals spe specifically with the review of the director. Okay. And two deals specifically with the review of the OPO. We split it out into two different sections, subsections. Got it. And so part uh, one, I'm okay with that. The second part obviously um, is the the uh, input to the city council. Um, I, I, I would, you're fine with the city administrator, but not the city council. And yeah, I would take that out based on what we kind of discussed before. Okay. And the only reason why for commission I'm doing this is because um, it, it's it's mandating it, and you know, and we're talking about an employee and the conflict, and so obviously we can go to the city administrator, but we want to, um, you know, not have that go to a, a 
uh, a city city council. So. That's a minor. That was a minor change on that. Oh, sorry, this went way off track here. Okay, there you go. So I removed the um, that the response shall be sent. To the city council and just left it as the city administrator. Okay, with that change, is everyone good with the rest of the changes? Any concerns, comments? Okay. Yeah, I just I have a point of clarification for John. Yeah. Uh, so the the charter states that to to the two officers, the city administrator, and who who else was that? What was the other position? I'm for, sorry. The, for the city charter yeah that 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 the city council oversees two employees right oh city attorney, city attorney. Uh -huh. and and so those are like are those like two positions stipulated in the charter or if they appoint more officers they would supervise those like how does that work that's just a great question that's an uh, excellent question i'm like they, uh, they are they are uh, stipulated in the city charter okay. who appoints them and and they're the only employees that actually have uh uh, employment contracts. The Myers Millis Brown Act, a different Brown Act, really forbids employment contracts. You can have MOUs or, or with like labor labor groups, which we do have, um, but individual employment contracts are basically only uh, allowed for the highest of the levels. And, and, and the two that have an employment contract are the city administrator and the city attorney. And this and their hiring firing review is specifically. Uh, stipulated in the uh, city charter cool thank you okay i will go ahead and accept these changes okay Let me just look and see okay the next section is the independent investigation section and i realize that we're going to have to make some changes in there based on um probably on John's um, assessment, but the, the one change that was made in here, and it's actually the same change just done twice, is that we've added language that says to the extent permitted by law um, in two different places in there. Does anybody have any concerns with that? That was just based on our last conversation. Okay. So with those accepted, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more on page 21. So in the section that is about the relationship between the Civilian Oversight Board and the Office of Police Oversight, um, there was language added really to just clarify, there was some duplication and it all centers around um, Supervised supervision of the CO, COB um, or who staffs them. And there was a lot of language about the community ombudsman position actually um, assist being in charge of creating the complaint process. But you had already in other sections determined that that would be done by the OPO and COB with input um, from the city attorney. So um, it was contradictory in, and in one place and then it was duplicative in another. Um, so, so this, the OPO community ombudsman will staff the civilian oversight board for their meetings and training. And the community ombuds will work directly with the COB to establish an annual training schedule with input from the city attorney and SBPD. Any questions about this section? Okay. Okay, so with accepting that, those were all of the current changes. Um, and so right now we have a clean document. 
So I'd like to open it up for any other sections that um, anyone would like to discuss. Christian. Um, we received public comment today from uh, one of the former commissioners of the body who had some recommendations about uh, some of the language. Um, I think at the very top, we say like when former commissioners resigned from the body. And the suggestion was that we change that to say when they served. Um, so very minor change, but I think an important one. <clears throat> yes, and thank you for bringing that up, Christian. It actually was, it, the, that change has um, been made to the document just because it had been made and I didn't see it as a suggested edit, I forgot to mention it. So yes, those changes have been made. Thank you. Um, Lizzie? Um, so the, this this comment is before conversations that um, that uh, Attorney Doyle has brought, but and and I don't anticipate I, I don't expect a conversation around this. I just want to remind the commission that in a couple areas of our recommendations, we state that we are um, in the the composition or qualifications that we are including relevant lived experience and that the board shall be broadly inclusive. Um, yet, um, it's, we have a very specific exclusion. So I just want to, you know, as, we're, as we are about to officially approve these recommendations, I just want to remind the board that we have those two very clear statements that I don't think that we're really honoring in, in an exclusive um, category. So, does that mean that we remove that? Does that mean that that we just acknowledge that that's a contradiction that we're making as we're presenting these recommendations? That's a good point. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, Rich? We've had um, two conversations and two votes about this already, and I think it really needs to go to the public. I don't really want to open that conversation up again when we've already discussed it twice. As I mentioned in my comment, I'm not anticipating a conversation around that, around that particular exclusion. I'm just noting that in our recommendations, there are two areas where we're being very clear in using language to say relevant lived experience and broadly inclusive. So those are the two things that I'm focusing on because we're not honoring that with an exclusion. So I'm curious what the commission feels about those two statements and that's on page six. Well, I think uh, we could maybe to, I guess, uh, avoid that. I think it's a good point, but maybe, I don't know how you could explain it, but maybe if we do, I mean, I wasn't, I, I, I didn't support it, but if, if that's what we're going with, I think we should maybe like explain why, or I don't know, or maybe it's not necessary, but I, I do think it is a point that should be addressed, like because people might wonder, um, I don't know. Thank you for that additional comment. Anybody else wanna to speak to this point? I will say um, that the, the, the survey and the facilitate, uh, facilitated focus groups will be, um, there are questions related to that specific, that membership topic as it relates specifically to law enforcement involvement. Um, and so we will, the conversation will continue because we'll get feedback from the community. And since these are going to be the approved draft recommendations, you will have another chance for a conversation about this with the community's input as part of that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. And thanks for bringing that up, Cami. I, I agree that this is something we should put in front of the public and really get their understanding and their, their feedback and uh, take that and improve the document. Thank you, Kim. Lizzie, I see that your hand's up. Outside of that comment, I'm wondering, based on what Attorney Doimus mentioned about the discipline, um, I'm wondering if we want to remove mention of discipline in these recommendations. And I, I think there was maybe like six or seven places that had that term. If I may, yeah, Commissioner Rodriguez, yeah, I was planning on kind of going over my minor changes and suggestions. Um, I can do I can do that now, or I can wait for the commission to finish their their comments. I I think that this would be as good a time as any. Okay, uh, let's go to at least it's my page. Uh, page eight. It's under authorities and duties, section E. Okay. Uh, number two, I would just have the COB shall be involved in the hiring, eliminate firing under I. Okay. We, and, but evaluation is fair game. As yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, so and right below that we have hiring slash firing. I would take out firing right there. Yep. You can leave hiring in, but. And then the other part is below it, take out uh, and city council. Okay. That's it for that section. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think if I missed one before that. Nope, okay, so then we'll go on to, my next change would be, um, uh, it's, it's on page uh, 10, it's section 10 contract to fulfill contract services to fulfill duties. Mm -hmm. There we go. The COB, I say, can request, so, it, so just take out all the abilities. I would just put can request. Contract services using the city's current process, and then I would put in under section 518 of the city charter. Okay. And then the section right below that to where it says to direct the uh, director of police oversight that I would add to request that city council contract. Okay. And my other change is um, the final change I have is um, on page uh, 13, the bottom. Now this could involve uh, the commission having discussion, but I, I would eliminate section eight based on our discussion. But what I would have in place, we could have something simple, but it could be, for example, you know, evaluating the patterns and trends and discipline for the department or something like that. So if, I'm, I, if I would, I would have like, based on its review of sustained SPPD misconduct investigations, you use force of incidents, uh, or I would have this, the OPO and the COB may conduct reviews on the pattern and trends and discipline issued by the police department, set up SPPD. How, and then I would put in however the, the commission shall make, not make recommendations concerning discipline for individual officers. And I will put the language why based on Okay. Due to of uh, due to city charter sections six oh seven and six oh four and six oh seven due to the uh, restrictions 
and city charter sections 604 and 607. And that's it. And then I would eliminate the, the rest of it. That would be my suggestion. Um, now, now that's a suggestion, you know, I, I am asking for elimination due to the conflict, but I put in language, at least what the commission talked about. And so feel free to, to banter on that. Other than that, I have no other changes to the document. Because the other issue about the, uh, as I mentioned before, on, on, the, on the Brown Act, we do have as law, as, as law permitted. So I think that's fine, as I said, to go out in public because we have that caveat in there. So I'm not concerned about that and gives us more time to look at that issue. Thank you, John. It. Thank you. Appreciate it. I, can I ask you one question, John? So if the, the OPO is able to do audits essentially of discipline and they're able to have findings that come out of that, is there an issue when you're saying that certain discipline was inconsistent based on discipline issued in other instances with the same um, level of misconduct? That's, that's an excellent question. I, and I think that's kind of what, for all these meetings, that goes to the intent of this commission, right? Mm -hmm. um, if they're able to look at and report trends and they feel that the, the management of the police department ha hasn't dealt with uh, severe misconduct with matching discipline, they can report that trend to the commission who then can you know, issue a report, express their concerns to the city council. And, and that's how that issue is, is, is dealt with. You're not talking about an individual officer, but you're dealing with an overall you know, um, systemic issue uh, within the department, if, if there is such a thing, we're using a hypothetical, obviously. Um, and, and that's kind of, I think, gets to the heart of the issue, right? It, 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 is the department being too lenient? Or let's say they're being, let's say they see other things. Let's say they think there's disparate impact or treatment based on gender or race or uh, any other protected category uh, as part of that, because the auditor would have access to those personnel records. And, and we're not making recommendations in discipline, but we're making recommendations in terms of what, 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 has, what, has, what has occurred, what's the overall trend, you know? Um, you know, uh, over the past course of the past year, several years. And uh, and then the commission can make recommendations and, and hold, in that way it holds management responsible or accountable, I should say, to, to that. So that's where that power lies in. And I think it's, um, I, I understand, I, and I hate being a bear of bad news. I think there's some disappointment in not being, you know, we obviously want to have as effective as a commission as po possible, but I think there's more change. It's my personal opinion. Again, there's more change and there's more, um, uh, it's much more helpful when you're able to address not only, not just the individual officer, but the overall, the overall issues, the spectrum of everything. And, and that's what this would allow. So uh, I, I don't see, cause you're, you're not dealing with the individual case file and it's, you're, not, you're not including names of officers, but you're looking at, here's the policy violations, here's the discipline issue, here are the trends we notice. that could be very appropriate and commendable or we have concerns, or we have disparate impact or treatment concerns. Um, that's perfectly allowable, doesn't conflict with the charter. And I think it addresses uh, an important issue that the commission um, is recommending uh, um, be resolved, you know, or not that it's, department has that issue, but wanting to at least uh, have an ability to address these issues. Thank you, I appreciate that, um, speaking to that. Um, Gabe, I see that your hand is up. Thank you. Uh, John, I have a couple of questions um, as it pertains to the suggested text. So would the oversight board and the OPO be able to review, well, I guess the oversight board is more important, would the oversight board be able to review case file, redacted case files that would give a lot of context for the discipline itself, right? Because you could have two similar situations, but there could be an important fact that would determine why one discipline was different than another um, versus broad categories. 
Jessica Cabedo, that's a really good question. Um, so if we're, the problem is if you're having the board interview the, uh, review the files also and how, how it, it goes back to the issue of are we going back in open session or not, right? And, and, and the problem, here's at least how, how I could see it being done. The, the, the employee, the, um, the OPO would be tasked with, you know, an assignment from the commission to, to review this, right? And they're looking at the files and looking at the discipline. And they do a, a report to the commission based on what they found. And they can't obviously tie names or individuals, but they could say, uh, example A is this, and here was a discipline, example B, let's say, let's say it's a disparate impact of treatment. And example A, officer did this, this, and this, and goes over the facts. And um, I, I see it, you know, uh, and then gives an example B, but, you know, not being specific. And, and here's the issues why there's inconsistencies, right? Th that could be done and that could be discussed in open session. And you avoid all that because it's not identifiable to any individual police officer. You're, you're getting a report and discussing trends and the report could be very detailed to talk about uh, certain facts without tying an individual officer to it. Um, so that's one way I could see it being done. Again, this is like off the top, top of my head. So I do, I do want to have a caveat, but I, I think the way to be, we'd be done is having that position, examine the personnel files, viewing it, creating a report, creating a, a matrix, a chart, kind of going into detail uh, and, and seeing what the trend is and what the issues are. So if I'm understanding you correctly, it would be, um, professional staff in the OPO would have access to the files. They would be able to determine what facts were important and then distill that into a report that was much more anonymous, but had all of the important facts that provided the context. Yeah, and going in, and going into the trends, right? And going yeah. into, because that's what that says, going into, um, you know, is, uh, what have been the trends, right? Let's let's say you had, a, let's say you have a, a, the, the professional staff OPO looking in, and, and they're looking at how how has the police department treated issues of dishonesty, right? And if they've seen that we've had severe dishonesties, but there's no discipline taken, the trend is that this department doesn't doesn't care about uh, the, or doesn't view the dishonesty as an important issue, or the the flip side. <laughs> <laughs> which was the case. The department very much cares. So, and, and, and for dis for dis issues of dishonesty, there's been a consistently basis of, uh, of of severely disciplining or terminating an officer if there are instances of dishonesty. And that trend could be reported. At least the commission, the public, can understand what that what that trend has been. And it's not it's not violating an officer's protections under POBAR. It's not violating the charter. But it's getting that information to the commission to see what the trends have been on that category uh, of, um, of uh, issue that's been uh, investigated and what the department has done on issues of dishonesty. That's just one example, right? Have they been too lenient? Have they been too uh, not? What have they been done? Have they been consistent about it? And you're able to see. So to me, the easiest way would be to cater, uh, you know, doing a review as to policy sections, right? And what are, what are the most severe misconduct, right? Excessive force, dishonesty, you know, uh, racial profiling, all, all those, right? Uh, how many complaints have we gotten and uh, how many of them have been sustained? What was the what was the discipline? Is it all over the place? Is it consistent? Stuff like that. Thank you. That's really helpful. And um, I guess what we're talking about, like thinking about this issue and um, digesting it a little bit, it's the limitations of an ordinance versus a charter amendment, right? On what we can include in the the recommendation. And thinking about at the end of this recommendation, we have three years after the creation, there's going to be a review, at which time I imagine the city could ask itself the question, uh, do we want to go out for a charter amendment now that we kind of know a little bit more about what it looks like in reality? We could add something to the effect of um, if the city goes out for a charter amendment, we suggest adding language, giving the oversight body that power to, to issue or recommend discipline, giving us access to the closed session. Is that right? Chair Scobitter, you are correct, or, or and, and more so. So what, what I did was, I understand that the commission wants to create this uh, via an ordinance. 
uh, and, and as an ordinance-based commission, right? And and that's kind of how I looked at it. And I, I'm looking at two things in terms of what you recommended. Where, where are you prohibited, right? And there's two areas where I'm, I'm looking at, like, uh, well, three. And any any conflict of interest issues being one. Any conflicts as to the charter, because the charter is uh, preempts any ordinance in terms of it's our, our number one body of laws, our city charter, and an ordinance can't contradict and conflict with the charter. And third, if there are any Brown Act issues. And so um, if, if the one basis, that there's the one basis where I think uh, the conversation is kind of constant focus on tonight is the, the discipline issue. I've pointed out where, where, where discipline is really conflicting the charter, who's allowed to, to issue it, recommend it, et cetera. Um, if there's a change, that would have to be a, be a charter amendment. And, and a recommendation um, to council could, could provide that. You know, uh, and, and you may want to you may want to provide more in the charter. You know, not just to just discipline. There may be more things you want to codify in the charter. You, you look at all the commissions. That's uh, all the commissions under Section 800 of the City Charter, and you see a lot of their powers and duties. Uh, I don't know if you want a 12-page document because maybe <laughs> it's the City Charter, but you may you may want to you know recommend codifying some major important duties uh, that could be codified in the City Charter. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Appreciate it. Christian? So um, Mr. Doimus in his presentation had brought up the POBAR potential uh, complication with the statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. And so I would love for us to review the section on the timeline of the, the review process um, and maybe like look at what would enable perhaps a more speedy process um, if we want to make amendments there to uh, not have a specific investigation uh, fall outside the statute of limitations. Thanks, Christian. Before we do that, do you mind, I just wanna make sure everyone is okay with making this change to sections uh, eight before we move on. The one thing, and John, can you tell me if this would be okay, rather than using the word reviews, using the word audits, so that there is more of an expectation for a standard that that work is being done held to. I think that's an excellent suggestion, Cami. Absolutely. And then after the highlighted section, I would delete the remainder of obviously eight. But yeah, aud audit is more kind of exactly what um, this would entail. So absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Does anybody, um, before we accept this, um, have any concerns about making this change. Okay, thank you. Cami, if I may, uh, as Commissioner Alonzo's request, I think uh, uh, I'm gonna put him on the spot. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Hill would be very key into this too, at, at least because he can go into the, uh, uh, he can speak much more to it than I can. He can go into the timeline and the pressures to conduct investigations, right? So let's say it takes a police department, you know, and, and that's my concern. Here, here's the example. Let's say it takes the police department six or seven months to conduct an investigation and they get it to the commission. And the way the process is written, that would leave another six months to the, uh, to the board for the process that's written there. And uh, you're also in your passing that and then everything becomes null and void at that point. And so that was my concern. Uh, when we have such an expansive process and you're coming back for a second review and all this, uh, and it's already taking, and you, you know, you're not having the entire year because the police department's looking at it first. And they may take sometimes some investigations, depending on the, uh, the issues and the multiple witnesses and everything else, and the workload too, <laughs> as I was within hell to speak on too, can take, can take a while. So, um, you know, there have been some close calls where we got them under the one year because of the difficulty of the investigation, but we did. So you add this, it's problematic. So I think uh, Lieutenant Hill's input 
viewpoint on this is very essential and, and the commission can ask him questions because he can speak to this more than I can. I just wanted to point out um, the issue into that. So thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Sean, do you wanna speak to that? Sorry, again, to put you on the spot. No problem, that's what I'm here for. I just need a more direct question of what, what, what um, if somebody could direct me some specific questions. I understand the, the general um, discussion that's happening, but happy to answer questions. So I guess, maybe start with the average time frame of an investigation into misconduct. <clears throat> well, um, investigations vary um, drastically. Uh, we tend to want to complete investigations in 120 days. Um, that's kind of our goal, um, but they can be delayed for a variety of reasons. Um, and as uh, uh, Attorney Doim has said, sometimes they can, um, when they're complicated, take almost a year. Certainly we don't want that. It's not good for our office. It's not good for our employees. One of the things that we consider during these investigations is the health and wellness of our employees to make sure that um, they aren't under this type of stressor of being investigated for um, a long amount of time if it's not necessary. Um, but there are some simple uh, complaints that come in, for example, where um, we can uh, receive the complaint and one week later have it reviewed um, you know, camera footage or body-worn cameras and, and it be resolved almost immediately. Um, there are other <clears throat> uh, investigations, for example, what we commonly refer to as Kubo or conduct unbecoming that can be just kind of verbal disrespectful comments uh, that is the context of the complaint. And that, that oftentimes will take a um, very short amount of time, a few weeks. Um, and there are other more complicated ones where we have to um, collect um, video footage or evidence from the community, private business, et cetera, um, uh, interview a multitude of Do we lose, do we lose Sean? Yeah, yeah. we lost. Uh, I'll, give him, I'll give him a second. Uh, can we can we go to page? Um, what is it? It's like it's like sixteen and part of seventeen for that section. Um, Sean, just let me know. He's uh, <laughs> he'll get back on one second. Uh, the one the, the simple question I, I'll have for him. I'll. I'll I'll cross-examine him when he gets back on the on here. Is is looking at looking at this section the way it's written and, and the process and procedures and the thirty days and coming back, and you look at your average complaint. So I'm not even talking about your complicated. Is, is it feasible to 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 uh, should there be a rise for the commission to want to do an independent investigation? Is it feasible to do so considering the time limits in POBAR? Um, my feeling, my feeling is, you know, some complaints share would be, but there's maybe some that we, we run into trouble, and so that's that's my that's my concern. I'm, and I'll wait for Sean to get back in to ask that question. But at least I wanted the the commission to know um, that that's where my concern lies. Am I, Cami? Uh, am I reading this right? And maybe for you, John, too. This is only, this isn't for every investigation that it comes to the COB. It's only when the director of police oversight identifies a problematic investigation. Is that right? Kimmy? Yeah. Yes. Right. And sometimes those problematic chairs can be the problem. Those problematic ones are, are extensive. And, and you know, um, you, 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 if you get a complaint from a citizen who makes a preposterous claim like, uh, you know, the officer was collaborating with aliens. You know, I'm not worried about. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about the timeline, or the or the uh, the uh, DPO uh, concerned about that. I'm talking about a more serious, more complicated one. Um, the, you know that 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 could be an issue, and all of a sudden we're up against the timeline to, to fulfill this obligation out there. Um, so. That's that's where I, where I, where I, where I'm lighting because I think this would be geared towards more ones that 
are past 120 days. We're close to it. So, uh, Chair Commissioners, I do apologize. Uh, my laptop was plugged in, so I guess the circuit's out or something. So, Sean, I, I, when you were gone, I was uh, kind of filling the, the air time for a second, and I want to ask you, you know, looking at E, we have it kind of on the screen, it's kind of uh, part in 16 and 17, you know, as Chair Escobedo pointed out very well, this, this isn't for every investigation, obviously, these are ones that the DPO identify as, as pro he has concerns with are problematic in terms of deficiency. And so we're not talking about easy ones. So I was saying that uh, a complaint that an officer could collaborate with an alien to, to something like that, you know, that would be, you know, reviewed quickly and, uh, and thoroughly and, and maybe done with, you know, we're talking about maybe ones that probably would tend to be more complicated. Looking at this process in, you know, 30 days and coming back and having a second one, um, do you feel that, um, this would be problematic in terms of meeting that one year deadline under POGAR, that, that, that this is too, too, too ex expansive of a process. Do we need to, do, does it need to be streamlined? Are there concerns about meeting that? Uh, what, what, what's your understanding or concerns with that? And are we, are we um, looking through the lens of the, um, the board making recommendations for, for discipline, is that what we're we're at? No, no, we're looking at it just to complete an investigation. So oh, I'm looking at I'm yeah. I'm, look, I'm looking at it at two lenses, right? I'm looking at it from your department's lens, like um, based on your workload and based on your history of investigations and, and potentially complicated ones and getting them done, uh, and then looking at what these provision provide here in, in this recommendation and looking at it from a board's perspective of you know going through this process and and I respect the process because. Um, they, they want to give as much um, uh, due process and respect to the department and the officer. And that's how, that's how I read this, you know, to allow them to do, to, to address those concerns that they feel that needs to be issues. Uh, are, are you concerned that we would not be able to meet the timeline? Now, when you dissect it, I want to point this out. There, there may, not, you know, generally, I think we could meet the timeline because don't forget, it's not, automatically when you read this automatically become an independent investigation right there's a long process before that before it becomes an investigation you come there's concerns it gets addressed uh then it gets finished and, and maybe that could be done in a couple of weeks with, with the review it will never need to get to the stage of getting an independent investigation but if the board feels that the investigation was not done correctly or is problematic or, or wants to have an independent investigation the way this is structured it, it, there's a lot of steps before that. And could we get to that independent investigation and could that independent investigation be done and all of this within that one year timeline, right? So the way I read this and look at it based on department's workload, how we do an average investigation. And then we look at all the steps we need before we get to an independent investigation. I'm asking, how is it possible to meet that one year deadline? Well, uh I think the question, um, I, I mean, there's a lot of variables that are that I'm missing in this, right? So for me to, to make a, the opine whether this is enough time, it depends on the request, right? It depends on how, how fast the department gets its investigation done um, and how fast the, uh, the commission responds with their request. And quite frankly, what that request is, um, is, that, is that a request that's going to take, you know, uh, two months in and of itself. So I, it, I, I have to say, it's going to be difficult for me to say yes or no to this because there's a lot of unknown information we're just kind of speculating i do understand i think there's a balance right i think that there needs to be a balance of what's a reasonable amount of time that the, the department has to respond we operate with one psu sergeant um, under certain circumstances we have uh, other sergeants or even sometimes lieutenants um, uh, assist in investigations um, but you know this one investigation that they're responding to is not their only job they have a lot of other duties that they're responsible for as well, um, including responding to you know major incidents and stuff. So I think it's difficult for me to say, I do understand the concern. Um, and I think it's a balance between allowing a reasonable amount of time for this investigative unit to complete the request. And I think the biggest issue I'm having here is I just can't say, because I don't know what the request is. Sure, sure. And your points are valid. Let, let, me, let me do this, maybe this may help. So let me break down E. Right, so 
you said before an average. Uh, I do feel like I'm. I do feel like I'm deposing you or something. So please, Sean, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, so let's so let's look at the language here. Upon review of a completed com uh, uh, completed complaint investigation by the Professional Standards Unit, uh, it may be determined determined by the DPO that addition additional information is necessary. Right. So we said you said that the average. Invest, our goal is 120 days. Let's take that, let's use 120 days as an example right now. Let's use that as the, the mean on the curve, right? Um, in such cases, a DPO in consultation with the COB shall identify specific areas of concern and take the following actions. So we're at 120 days right now. Let's use that as the baseline. We go and request additional information containing the complaint uh, or return the investigation for further, right? So then you have 30 days to provide it or complete. So now we're at 150. Right. Uh, then the DPO can accept the complaint or forward to the CEOB for review to determine additional information. Right. Don't forget that's at, at a meeting. So now you're potentially talking about 180 or maybe even 210 days, depending on where this can fall on the calendar. Right. Um, the board then all of a sudden goes on and may identify new concerns that may cause the investigation to remain incomplete, uh, but there must be a direct nexus to the originally identified concerns. Then the professional standard unit shall have 30 days to return to the COB with a completed investigation to address the board's concern. So now you're talking anywhere from 210 days to 240 days potentially, right? Because you're adding an extra 30 days. Uh, if the investigation is deemed deficient after returning it for a second time, then the DOP can refer the matter and upon two thirds majority vote, direct the DOP to work with the city administrator's office to conduct an uh, independent investigator. So then you add another meeting, another 30 days potentially, right? For the next, maybe let's say the commission meets monthly. So you're talking about 200, 200, 240, 270 days. You have about 90 or 100 days to complete the investigation. So I guess if we break it down, you know, there is time and you're right, there's very variables. Uh, and so there is time when we're probably talking about the mean or if we're talking about a, a less complicated complaint. But if we're talking about a more difficult complaint with multiple witnesses and all that, you, and the variables that you mentioned, I, I do have concerns about completing that in time. If I'm just trying to kind of mathematically break the break a timeline down based on the language we have here. Um, with me doing that, if we do have a complicated you know, at least complaint or investigation that deals with a lot of moving parts, a lot of witnesses. You know, is there a concern that this could pass our one year uh, POBRA, POBAR deadline? So, John, are you suggesting that one of the solutions to this is to take out the second step, or I guess technically the third step, so that it, the OPO, if they find that deficiencies in the investigation, they send it back. If it comes back and still has deficiencies, then they have the ability to either leave it as is or initiate an independent investigation and not send it back again, as it now states. No, you know, the interesting thing is I, I like that. You know, I, I like the, the, you know, in terms of the, the ability for the police department to do that. Um, but I, I see your point because you know you're taking an additional step away. I my only concern is I, I wanted the commission to, make, to be making aware. Maybe maybe some language where where the second step is eliminated if we pass a day threshold. So if it's like you know 200, if it's like you know day 300 or 270 or something uh, of an investigation, we don't send it back a second time because we are. We are worried about the one-year statute of limitation. So I don't want to remove steps because I like the way it's spelled out by the commission, but I think we have to have, we have benchmark days in there in terms of reporting back. But we, we also, what we're missing in there is the, the one-year timeline. And again, it doesn't always apply to, I, I've got to mention that there's certain cases, you know, that have uh, an exemption to the one-year timeline, but m maybe it's putting in a, um, a, a, a marker. So if I look at this, um, if I could have time, you know, I could maybe try to work on some language um, that uh, if I have the commission's 
permission to at least uh, put in the final the final draft as, as, a, as a benchmark, right? If, if you're with, with, within 60 days of the pole bar deadline, we yeah. skip that second step. That's, that's what I was thinking of. I think that may resolve that. Gabe, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I did. I was just going to highlight that point that we don't necessarily need to figure out what that threshold is. John can help us. Mm -hmm. But um, having the process in the draft is probably the most important part. Y yes, and you know, I think that's fine. I think for public consumption, this is this is this is great, right? Because I don't think uh, it substantially changes the intent of what you want to accomplish here. What you what the board wants to accomplish is thorough investigations, align the police department to. Uh, uh, address any concerns that they feel are deficient. And then if they feel those, after some time, if they feel those concerns are not addressed, um, allowing for an independent investigator. And I'm not going to change that. That substantially should or remain the, the same. I just want to, and maybe it doesn't need it for this, actually, that I think this through. It's probably not even needed uh, as part of the recommendations. Uh, but when you get into the uh, uh, details of how this would go about, that's where we probably will need like timeline markers um, to, to do that, where, where we skip maybe, as Cammy mentioned, the second step, if we're up against the clock for, for POBAR. And that's really about it. But as far as, uh, as sending this out to public, I have no concerns and I would not change substantively what's provided here. Thank you, John. Lizzie, did I see your hand up earlier? Uh, I think it was answered. Thank you. Okay. okay. Any other comments on that section? Okay. Any other com? Oh, Christian, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was slow on the lower on the raise hand button. Um, I um, uh, I would. I would really like to see that language um, and I would love to give uh, Mr. Doimus that extra time to, to look at it because um, I think that when we, when we envisioned this like workflow initially, like we just, we didn't have a uh, POBAR in mind. And so I think it would be good to, um have that reflected like and I, I would like to see like maybe a couple of different options um like the chair was was saying because i think it i think it warrants further discussion thank you christian good points serafina um i actually have a question for the commission on a previous section um so lizzie is yours about this section okay go ahead then well, I, I just wanted to clarify Christian's point that in that particular work group, we did have um, Lewis, who was a valuable resource when it came to um, POBAR and statute of limitations. So we, we did consider that. What we didn't consider is how long um, the, the, the investigation can take. And also depending on when in that timeline, the, the community member filed the complaint. So um, those are all like specific nuances that we didn't consider, but we, we did look at the statute of limitations in POBAR and that. And I think this is a really good conversation or, or, or you know, something to, to consider. I don't know, I don't think we need to have that decision before we present to the community. I think it could be, it could be written in the fine details of the, of the ordinance. Thank you, Lizzie. Serafina, back to you. Yeah, um, I actually had a question for the commission on the previous section that we were on, section eight. I believe that's on page 15. Um, and it was on, yeah, section eight on page 15. Um, so for this one, I wanted to know if we were comfortable having the commission not make recommendations based on discipline. I know it's not allowed with the current city charter, but I was wondering if we wanted to make amends or ask city council to make amends to that city charter in order to do that. 
Um, otherwise, it, I mean, it kind of seems like they'll just be able to audit, give some feedback on general patterns and trends, but they won't have any power to do anything or to say anything for individual officers, um, which seems valuable to me. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering what the rest of the commission thinks about that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And that was the point I was trying to raise earlier. Um, and I think the current setup is, it could work, but it's based on the norms and that you're assuming that, you know, people will do what you think they should do. But it, what if that doesn't happen? There has to be, I feel like a mechanism. I think that's the whole point of this. So um, I think that should be discussed further. We've seen, uh, I don't wanna mention any president's names, but we've seen times when norms aren't followed in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in government. And it kind of triggers a situation where, you know, you're frustrated because you think this is how, there's no direct force or, or rule that says this should be done, but it's, it, you think it should be done a certain way. But then when that doesn't happen, like what's the recourse? So I feel like there has to be some sort of mechanism to ensure accountability, because that's ultimately what the, the, the thing that drove this process was anyways, was accountability and discipline has to do with accountability too. So. Agreed, yeah. And I and I kind of going off of that and to add to what I had said originally is that again, I am assuming that, you know, the police department will follow the norms of disciplining correctly and as needed. Um, but again, I feel like it, it could almost be like a safety net of if that doesn't happen sometime in the future, you know, 20, 30, 50, 70 years down the line, um, that this oversight commission can also make a recommendation for discipline if needed, um, if it isn't followed. So, and I have seen that from other commissions from what I've read throughout the country is that, you know, they have the ability to audit and make recommendations, but then there have been a few cases that slipped through the cracks where they weren't, they made recommendations for discipline, but they weren't followed because they didn't have to be followed. So I would really urge the commission to just consider asking city council for an amendment to the charter. Um, it's, yeah, go ahead, Christian. Yeah, I mean, um, I agree with what you're saying. I think the specific conundrum that we find ourselves in is that we're like caught in between the Brown Act law and the city charter as it relates to, um, how, and like, because keep in mind, like, I agree with you, there's lots of other ordinances that we've reviewed, but every city charter is different. Every state law that governs, um, you know, open meeting laws is different. So we have to kind of operate in the confines here. I think that um, maybe, I agree with what you're saying, Serafina. Um, I'm thinking that maybe the way that that is reflected in the recommendations is a section that outlines like additional opportunities for um, like future consideration by council. Cause like, ultimately with a charter amendment like you it's by ballot petition or it's by the city council has to do it right so um i think that maybe we could add that as a separate section um but as it relates to like the actual functioning of the of the board i think we would have to we would have to be we wouldn't want to recommend something that's literally legally not possible right but I agree, but we could also, like you said, we could have like a separate section saying like, this is what we would do if we could, but since we can, this is what we can do. I mean, I think we, there's ways to present it to show what we really feel, but it's ultimately what we feel. And if we don't feel as a group, that's the way we should do it. I'm totally respect that. But I think if we feel that way, we should voice it somewhere in the document. Lizzie? Serafina, I think you raised a really good um, discussion topic. And at 8.30, I don't think that now is giving that topic justice if we try to tackle that. I wonder if we can kind of have, maybe as 
once we get feedback from the community, we can have like an addendum of additional recommendations, include revisions to the charter, such as, and, and, and that way it's not necessarily part of this document, but that we also recommend, you know, should the group decide to do that. Because I think that's an interesting, and, I, and I've had that question about other areas of, of our, you know, of our work here. And I just didn't know if that was something we wanted to tackle as a, as a commission. But I, I think what you're discussing is, is really important. And I think we could do that with, um, with really good, you know, robust conversation around it. So, and I would recommend that we, we do that at a, at a different time, but definitely have that on our agenda for discussion. Does everybody feel comfortable with that solution, kind of tabling that so this, the next conversation about um, what the final recommendations will look like? Yeah, I would say I'm in favor of that, just because as you know, as I sit with this document, as we sit with what Mr. Doimus just provided and all these changes, I'm just like, well, then what what does this board do um, to hold folks accountable? Um, and so that that to me seems really important um, and would be interested in having more dialogue around that. But thank you, everyone, for all your input. This has been really great. Thank you for that, Jordan. Anything else from about any other? Christian. Sorry, just really quick. I mean, I think we're still waiting for more research on like what is legally possible with the closed meeting exception to the Brown Act. And um, I think we're all very curious to see <laughs> what the what Mr. Doimus turns up. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say if you have specific questions that you want answered to reach out to him. Thanks, Christian. <laughs> Sorry for coughing. Absolutely, Commissioner um, Alonzo. Yes, I would like, I would absolutely <clears throat> welcome that. And I, I'm on it. Um, I also think I addressed the issue with the uh, in the uh, independent investigations. I think Cam I can put in language in there right now. So if we go to it, um, sorry, I think it's page uh, sixteen and seventeen. We can go to seventeen. Um, yeah, let's go to the end of that. Keep scrolling down. Uh, is that the end of it? Yeah. Yep, so at the, la the yeah, the last, so the la we'll add a, la a paragraph at the end, right? And this is what I would state. Um, if the DPO believes a second referral to the SPPD could compromise an independent investigation. Being completed within the police officer bill of rights statute of limitations. The DPO does not have to refer or no, no, the matter does not have, sorry, the matter does not have to re be referred to the police department for a second time. For, for a second time, sorry. Uh, 
and then we can put as stated in at the end as stated in section uh it double i yeah oh no as as, sta as stated above sorry as stated above that's it okay that's a preceding paragraph yep that's it i think that i think that addresses the issue because i think you cut down a second a second review and then all that you know we're talking about 60 90 days and you're up against the clock that's i think that addresses the concern that would be it that's my final recommendation on that thank you john appreciate that any questions about that additional language Anything else anybody would like to bring up? Okay, then with that, thank you everyone. This has been an amazing discussion. Um, you have, well, pending probably a, a vote, depending on how you wanna handle this, Gabe, you guys have a draft rec set of recommendations pretty amazing. You guys have Good done job. Amazing work. Well done. And thank you, Cami and John and Sean for all yeah. of your help. This was amazing. Couldn't have done it without you guys, Cami, John, and Sean. And Sam. Definitely. Oh. Sam. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So let's open up public comment. And after that, we will entertain a vote. All right, Chair, members of the commission, if there is anyone in the public that would like to speak on this item, please click on the raised hand feature. If there is anyone in the public that would like to speak on item seven, discussion and review of draft language for the oversight model, please raise your hand or click on the hand raise Icon, there are no hands raised. All right, so we'll close public comment and we'll take it back to the commission. Is there a motion to approve the draft language to go out um, for a community outreach effort? Make the motion to approve. All right, Damo with Seconded. <laughs> Rachel with the second. <laughs> All right, any discussion? I'm not seeing any. Sam, can we do a roll call vote, please? Sure. There's been a motion by Commissioner Adam Malika and seconded by, I believe, Rachel Johnson to approve the draft language of the oversight model. Commissioner Adam Malika? Yes. Commissioner Alonzo? Aye. Commissioner Chavez? Yes. Commissioner uh, Chair Escobedo? Yes. Commissioner Kim Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Rachel Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Killebrew? Yes. Commissioner Rodriguez? Yes. Commissioner Sander? Commissioner Sander? I, be I believe that he said yes. Commissioner Wood? Uh, yes. I don't know what that is. Yeah, there's some type of uh, And vi Vice Chair Zapata? Yes. And Commissioner Reno? Yes. Motion passes. All right, we did it. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. It was a long road to get here, but we made it. Um, so with that, we will close out this item, which is item number seven. We'll move on to item eight, which is future business. And as stated in the email, we want to do a quick special meeting next week to just go over the survey language get everyone's approval, and then we are done for a while and everybody gets to take a break and marinate and let the... Go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, I just wanna, um, can we just go over the timeline real quick? I know it's late, but I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page of what is expected of us um, as I move forward, um, just because I want yeah, to make sure we're all on the same page. Sorry, everyone. I know people are tired. <laughs> no, it's a good, it's a good question. And Cami, if you could help me out as well. Um, so 
Next week would be approving the survey language. We're almost done. We're just uh, fine tuning a few things which we're meeting tomorrow to do. And then we would cancel our meeting on the 23rd. And that week we would have our focus group meeting. Well, let me back up. The 15th, we're gonna have our city council meeting. It's gonna be a good opportunity to tell everyone about our outreach effort, get the word out about the um, eventual survey. Once we get the commission's approval, we can start um, spreading the word about the survey amongst our networks. And then um, hopefully the city's gonna do the same. And then the 23rd, 24th, and 25th, we're gonna have our focus groups. Shortly after that, uh, CCI is going to start developing a memo based on the information that they're receiving from both the surveys and the focus group. I forget about when we would get that back because I think I missed that meeting for that discussion. Cami, do you remember about how long it would take for the memo to come back? Um, I believe that it's like the second week in March. I think she's turning it around really fast. Yeah. That that's kind of what I remember too. So around the second week of March is when we get the memo back um, with the community feedback. And then from that point forward, it's uh, us taking into consideration that feedback, additional information from John um, and and others for us to make our final edits to the the recommendation. And then in April, which we're hoping city council approves our extension of one month. We're gonna be making our last edits to the draft and preparing for our presentation for city council. And if I left anything out, please uh, fill in the gap. And next week, uh, Chair Scabetta, next week's council, uh, next week's meeting is in council chambers, correct? Sam and. Uh... So, so just want to confirm that with the uh, the commission. Uh, at one point when we thought the meeting was going to take place on the 23rd, uh, we had sent out an email inquiring whether those would be you know, physical or virtual. Um, is the preference of the commission to keep it uh, Zoom next week? Yeah, I think okay. so. Okay, I, I can't come in next week, but I can be online next week. So, does that yeah, make I think sense? we, yeah, I think we do Zoom next week, okay. especially if it's a quick. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any questions or any other future business from the commission? Um, I have a question. So the twenty third, twenty fourth, twenty fifth is when we're going to be doing the survey with the different groups, correct? And so if there's um, like any requests for any like language or um, that will also be provided, if there's a need for like different translations and everything, right? Okay. Right, right. Okay. yeah. We're, for the focus group specifically, we are doing individual reach out. We've already identified the different categories of stakeholders yeah. and different organizations. But yeah, we translation services will, um, they can request that. Okay, perfect. And then um, I, I know that we have that list going. If we have any additional um, or groups and organizations, or if anybody reaches out after, we can include them with the survey? Like, e Well, we have the survey. So the survey is separate from the focus groups and the survey will be open to the entire public and they can um, submit the survey. So we want that to get to as many people as possible. The focus groups, we've identified specific stakeholders. Those are gonna be smaller, so they're gonna be limited and we can't include everyone. Um, but if there is space in one of them, we, we could possibly include someone from another organization. Okay, and then I also wanted to request if for the survey, since it's going to be open for the public maybe having some printout copies like where they can pick it up like maybe at city hall like city hall or like wherever you know um a community like even um like the even at the gallery or at central or wherever we we would like to have them available in person and to be picked up um and then like if we could do like a qr code or something as well 
um, just to make it more accessible for, for all folks. Good idea. Any other items for future business? All right. Oh. Rich, your sound is still not working. It, no. We're getting a strange feedback loop of what might be Christian. Still not working. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I don't know what the problem is, but uh, it was working that way earlier. Uh, what Serafina brought up in terms of making uh, another amendment to that report, does that need to be something for new business? Because I think that that is a larger conversation that is really important. And yeah, I think, yeah, I just wanna, I, I was kind of surprised with that being uh, in John Doimus's report that that being like a minor thing, it seems like a pretty major deal that we're unable, the COB is unable to have any influence over police. <laughs> uh, and I think that we really need to discuss that a lot further. Um, yeah, so and that, is that going to be agendized or what do we need to do? Yeah, that'll be agendized. We were talking about doing that after the outreach effort. So we're looking at March. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. Anything else? All right. So good job, everyone. Um, we can close out the meeting at 8.45 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Great work. Uh, yeah, see you next week. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone.